welcome and thank you for joining us for the roundtable discussion on business, human rights and the environment, uh, priority actions for government and multilateral organizations. I'm Dori from Q and will be your technical facilitator today. Also joined by Kavya, Adarsh and Prabina, who will be providing back end support throughout the session. Uh, your mic and video control for the moment is disabled until after the panel discussion, um, and we will re-enable after that. Uh, but the chat function is available to you if you have any questions for the speakers or any comments. Please note that the session today is being recorded. And if you have any questions about Zoom or required technical assistance, please feel free to privately message TF Dory or uh, Kavya, Adarsh or Prabina uh, for help using the chat box. I'll now hand over to Sean. Sean, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dory. Uh, and greetings, everyone. My name is Sean Lees, and I'm a business and human rights specialist for UNDP based here in Bangkok, Thailand. Today, I'll be your host for this first of a series of roundtables on business and human rights and the environment conducted in partnership with the European Union and UNEP. It doesn't seem that you have my video. Uh, I'm going to unclick something. There we go. Hi. On our agenda today, and I ask Dory if you would, uh, in our chat box, place the agenda. Um, we will hear first from our keynote speakers, Dr. Surya Deva and Isabel Destoglier. Following this, we will move into a roundtable discussion with experts from a variety of disciplines. Um, following that segment, we'll go into a breakout room where we have a chance to, to make your voice heard. Finally, finally, we will report back uh, on our breakout room findings at the close of our meeting. Now, we, we may run over uh, the 1.5 hour uh, time frame that we've been given, uh, but I hope you'll stay on to the end to hear feedback uh, from the breakout rooms. And the objective of our, our roundtable today is threefold. Uh, to validate the results of our uh, recent online survey on business human rights and the environment, to get feedback uh, that might shape programming, policy, and advocacy efforts by multilateral entities like UNDP, uh, like UN, oops, this side, and UNEP, um, and to foster greater dialogue between environmental and human rights experts. To help us reach these objectives, uh, we're joined today by Georgina at UNEP. Uh, Georgina, can you kindly introduce yourself and our first speaker? Thank you so much, Sean. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for joining us today for this roundtable. As Sean said, I'm Georgina Lloyd, and I'm the Regional Coordinator for Environmental Law and Governance, the United Nations Environment Program in Bangkok. I am delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Surya Deva. Surya is an Associate Professor at the School of Law of City University of Hong Kong and a member of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. He has published extensively and has advised the UN bodies, governments, multinational uh, corporations, and civil society organizations on matters related to business and human rights. He's also one of the founding editors in chief of the Business and Human Rights Journal. So with that brief introduction, Surya, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Georgina, and uh, thank you everyone for inviting me. Uh, at the outset, I would like to congratulate uh, the BHR team of UNDP and UNAP for coming together in uh, hosting this roundtable on a very topical and important issue because we are trying to link the business and human rights agenda and the issues about environment and climate change. And I think this survey should also help in moving forward in informing how we should move. Now, in these brief remarks, I would like to focus on uh, two aspects. I will make some basic points, and then I have six suggestions as a way forward, which could inform the discussion, hopefully in this roundtable and in future. Let me start with some basic points. I would say that the environmental pollution and climate change impacts each and every human right, civil, political, social, economic, and cultural human rights. So this interconnection is inescapable. It is very much clear, but it is going to become more and more visible and prominent in years to come. At the same time, we should be aware that the impact of climate change or the environment on all of us is not uniform. The impact is differentiated on men and women, children and boys, uh, migrant workers, indigenous communities or some countries, some island countries may be impacted more. So when the states and multinational organizations are uh, 
drafting their agenda and policies, they have to keep that differentiated and disproportionate impact in mind, rather than thinking that all of us are going to be impacted in the same identical manner. We should also not ignore the rights of the future generations because sometimes we focus on who we are, the rights holders, including children who are going to become adult. But there will also be people who are not even born yet. They might be born in the future. So how are we going to protect the rights of those future generation people? This is going to become a key issue because many of us, many human beings are very selfish. We are self-centered and have myopic vision. So how do we ensure that the nature and the planet is also good enough for future generations who are not even born at this particular point of time? And my last point about the basic issues is that of course, environment and climate change have a linkages with human rights. They also have a value of remaining independent issues because there are significant differences between human rights issues and environmental issues and climate change issues. So I think we should not think that the environment and climate change is subsumed within the business and human rights and human rights agenda and everything else is lost. I give a very simple example, corruption. Corruption can potentially impact each and every human right, but it does not mean that corruption is no independent issue. It remains an independent issue as well. So I think we should see this in this particular manner. So let me very quickly move on to the six points that I had suggested uh, I, I would throw uh, for consideration in today's workshop and in future. The first is right to information, which also came out uh, during the survey. I think it is absolutely critical that uh, governments and as well as businesses, including state-owned enterprises, they are more transparent in terms of what they're doing and what they're not doing. There are a number of push and pull factors about ESG disclosure and all that. But I think this disclosure is different from right to information because we have a stake in how governments and businesses decide climate policies and actions. We should be able to demand that information as and when we need it efficiently. And I think a larger question, which I will not elaborate on today, is that we need to make corporations more democratic institutions going forward. It's not merely shareholders, but people like us who must have a say in the board of the directors of these companies when they're taking these decisions. My second point is that the decision-making process has to be bottom-up and participatory. Many of the challenges that we see in the space of environment and climate change is because the decision-making is centralized and we are always looking for global solutions. So we need to sometimes look at the local solutions, the bottom-up approaches and participatory because what may work in Indonesia with 10,000 islands may not work in Qatar or in India or in China or in France. So there are different circumstances and I think those uh, innovative solutions must be kept in mind. The third point is about human rights due diligence. I think this is a very uh, universally accepted point that businesses need to integrate climate considerations into the human rights due diligence processes. Otherwise, they cannot respect human rights. But what I would like to highlight here is this, that we should understand that the due diligence for climate change is going to be different than it has been for human rights. The process of consultation, the identifying the impact holders. And I think this impact typology is also going to change. So the due diligence will be relevant, but it will be a different kind of due diligence in my view. My fourth point is that prevention is never foolproof. It is inevitable that there will be adverse impact on people and communities. And that is where the issue of access to remedy and accountability is going to be absolutely vital. And I'm sure uh, Commissioner Roberto Cardiz will talk about uh, the Philippines human rights experience. So I think you can connect this point in particular context. My second last point is about coherence. Policy coherence for states, multinational organizations and corporations is absolutely vital. How we negotiate trade and investment agreements is going to have bearing on climate change. 
what companies do in terms of their lobbying is going to have implications. So let us say we have a company which says we respect human rights, but the same company is lobbying the government to continue the fossil fuel. This is incoherence. If we, have, if we have a particular government which is not investing on public transport and encouraging people to buy more cars, at the same time, they want to reduce the impact on climate change. There is a policy incoherence here. So policy coherence is going to be absolutely vital. And my last point is, and I'll finish with that, is that we need a radical shift in how we define the idea of development. World Bank will classify countries like Papua New Guinea as developing country. Why? Because their GDP is less, per capita income is less. So you're looking at the dollars, but you're not looking at the sustainability dimension of PNG. You're not looking at how for thousands of people they have been able to preserve the rivers and the forest. So I think we need to reconceive this whole idea of development. Is it quantified in terms of GDP and the per, per capita dollars? And I think that is where I would like to ask all of you to consider, do we need to go back to the bikes or battery operated cars? Because now we are pushing for battery operated cars, but they might become part of the problem as plastic bags have become now. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Deva, uh, for your powerful comments. Um, I, for me personally, the, your opening was it was in, in, in particularly impactful. The environmental challenges impact on all our human rights, but not all impacts will be felt equally. Um, I think for our next speaker, uh, your messages on on policy coherence being viable will be is, is particularly well received. Um, Isabelle de Stoblier, our next speaker, is uh, the trade counselor at the Economic and Trade section of the UN delegation to Thailand. Uh, she covers the areas of trade and sustainable development, customs and trade facilitation, intellectual property rights, and EU trade relations uh, with Thailand and Laos. She joins us today to give us insights into the green dimensions of the EU's new trade policy. Isabel, I give you the floor. Hi, um, hello, um, dear uh, Dr. Suri, um, Georgina, Sean, you and colleagues, um, honorable speakers, ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, of course very honored to be invited here um, and to uh, deliver a few opening remarks on behalf of the EU, a bit difficult after the very uh, wise um, word uh, of Dr. Uh, Suri, but uh, um, I will try to do, to do my best. And this only in five minutes, challenging when we uh, uh, are uh, discussing such a fascinating uh, a topic. So, as you said, I've, I've, I'm working on the trade and sustainable development issues, among others, and this is uh, um, something I started to work on um, in Bangkok four years ago. Uh, and when I started working on that, I must say that at that time, um, in our daily work in the EU delegation, we were way more uh, focused on um, purely um, market access issues and this is um, prevailing in our work and today this is no longer no longer true um, this um, this um, concept of uh, of uh, human rights um, uh, due diligence um, uh, sustainability this has become um, this has gaining significant ground um, among the large public and uh, this is no longer uh, an issue that is uh, reserved to uh, a bubble of experts, um, um, you know, a group of uh, rich um, uh, countries or whatever. This is something that has become a key concern among the citizens and the, the consumer uh, worldwide. And I would like to commend actually the approach uh, taken um, in this uh, roundtable uh, and, and by the UNDP um, uh, by looking at uh, human rights and sustainability, uh, environment, uh, all this in combination, because this is the right way to look at it. Uh, the relationship um, is uh, obvious, and this is how we, um, we do uh, it too in the, in the EU. 
So I just want to give you a few a few um, insight into the what we are doing in the EU in the in this respect in the field of sustainability. You might have heard about the um, adoption of the uh, European Green Deal in 2019. Um, this Green Deal is actually our sustainable growth strategy. Um, it, it it actually reaches to all the policies that are applied internally and. Dr. Soria, you were um, told um, consistency, uh, coherence. Uh, this is why, what we are trying to do in the EU and um, through uh, notably the Green Deal. And uh, the objective of the Green Deal is basically to make um, Europe the first climate neutral continent by 2050. We have a roadmap, we have um, um, key uh, policy areas identified, and we have very importantly um, in the making a European climate law that will turn all those political commitments into a legal obligation. Um, and also it will turn it into a trigger for investment, uh, we believe, um, and we want to make sure that all the EU policies contribute to the climate neutrality uh, objective. Um, it is also very important in this context that uh, we uh, also ensure that this transition uh, is uh, fair and inclusive. So the Green Deal also um, include a, a just transition mechanism to ensure this in inclusiveness. And um, it also um, want to ensure that um, uh, the health and well-being of people are protected from um, environment-related uh, related risks. Um, so you will have understood that the Green Deal is now the driving force uh, behind all the internal and external policies of the EU. It is the compass of the EU growth strategy, but also for our recovery after the pandemic. And um, indeed, looking at turning to trade, this is a very powerful um, a tool. Uh, so uh, trade is very powerful to trigger business responsibility vis-a-vis -vis human rights and um, environmental uh, concerns. And um, we are doing this in the EU through um, legislations, through policies, and through uh, trade, uh, trade agreements. So when we look at the legislation, we have sectoral based uh, legislation like the one on um, the import of timber of minerals from conflict affected areas and there is a mandatory due diligence imposed on EU importers of those goods. But again, very importantly, and this is in the context of the Green Deal, but also a trade policy, we have uh, in the making a horizontal mandatory due diligence legislation um, that uh, is being developed now and that will apply to all EU companies uh, on their supply chains, regardless of the sectors they operate in. And it's not only about, um, uh, of course, environmental concerns, it's also about um, uh, human rights and uh, labor rights um, issues. So in terms of policies, um, you might have heard as well that we adopted uh, our new trade strategy uh, in March 2021, this year. Um, and it is called open, sustainable and assertive trade policy. So I think it, it tells everything, right? I mean, that it focuses on three elements, sustainability. Sustainability meaning that we make of the Green Deal the central pillar of a trade policy. And the trade policy should be used to serve the objectives of the Green Deal. The second is um, the WTO reforms. So we, we, it relates to the openness uh, we still need to keep uh, the multilateral trading system functioning and open and then enforcement, meaning in that case that the EU uh, will not shy away uh, from enforcing its right, defense its values more assertively, and this particularly in the field of sustainability. And a couple of examples of um, actions we take um, under the sust sustainability pillar of the trade policy is that at WTO level, we will bring forward what climate and sustainability initiatives. Um, we will um, make of the Paris Agreement on climate change an essential, an essential element in our bilateral uh, trade agreements. Um, also, we um, will build global alliances to drive global change 
um, and including and most particularly in the field of um, sustainability. And then finally, trade agreements. Well, you might uh, know that uh, we have a very strong trade and sustainable development chapter in our bilateral uh, agreements, which touches both upon uh, labor rights um, stemming from the ILO uh, core conventions, but also um, the um, environmental rights, let's say, uh, coming from multilateral environmental agreement. Um, and these are not cooperation kind of commitment. These are binding commitments. And um, it has to be included in every trade agreements we sign. We have with our agreement with Vietnam, Singapore, Korea, Japan, and it is included also in the, in the negotiation with Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand. Um, so this is a bit how we, we make it. And just to conclude, um, just a couple of comments on the survey. And uh, yes, um, Dr. Um, Surya, um, I fully agree. And I had the uh, same kind of comment, you know, when we look at the solutions, and uh, the access to information and ensure that there is an inclusive decision making. I cannot agree more, uh, but it, uh, and obviously this cannot be dissociated from the absolute need for good governance, transparency. We have to tackle the issue of corruption because these are, um, you know, this is a these are fundamentals to any democratic society. And finally about engaging the youth in solution making. Uh, yeah, absolutely, of course. Um, well, the youth and uh, future newborns, <laughs> somehow, uh, we will need um, to increase their awareness um, on, on, on these topics, even though I'm certain that they are maybe more aware than we are um, uh, today. But this also should be put into the broader context, which is that of democracy and political rights, and to the right to education. Um, right to quality education, meaning uh, that this has, has to take place in a democracy because a quality education is not only about acquiring technical knowledge, hard skills, it's about acquiring critical thinking and an innovative forward looking uh, spirit. So ladies and gentlemen, my apologies if I've been a bit too long, as I said, very difficult to wrap it up in five minutes <laughs> when it touches upon the essence of humanity and the future of our planet. Um, I think there is political momentum and um, um, we can all go forward um, on the path of sustainability. So I wish um, the best of everyone's, uh, that we make the best of everyone's contribution today. And on behalf of the EU, we will stand by. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, very powerful comments. Uh, indeed, trade is one of the most powerful tools to get business to uh, adopt responsible behavior. We've seen that in multiple countries um, uh, over the last couple of years where the EU and other actors have, have uh, used the, the, the toolbox, their, their trade toolbox, uh, to ensure that rights are respected, uh, that environmental provisions are respected. Um, and I, I like hearing that the trade policy serves the Green Deal. So it's the Green Deal that's driving trade policy in the EU now. An important message too on enforcement, a need for transparency, and even a comment there at the end, Isabel, on, on education uh, and educating youth with those critical thinking skills they need to innovate solutions for the future. Uh, a very broad uh, and, 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 and powerful uh, presentation from the EU. Thank you so much for your comments. Just a, a, and one more thing too, to, to remind people that, that the EU is South Asia's largest trading partner. And I think in Southeast Asia, you're the second largest trading uh, trade partner. So you have significant influence um, over the, the, on the business and human rights uh, agenda and ensuring the environmental and human rights risks and in, in, in supply chains here and elsewhere um, are, are mitigated, are addressed. So thank you so much to both uh, Dr. Deva uh, and, and, and uh, Ms. Gustavier uh, for your comments today. Uh, without further ado, let's move right along, if I may, to uh, our survey. Many of you have seen this already, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a summary of the summary of our survey results. Uh, it's important to know uh, that this survey uh, is not trying to be the last word by any stretch. We understand its limitations, uh, but indeed, we do think it's uh, indicative of, of sentiments, of perceptions in our region. Uh, the survey took part, uh, took place over three, three weeks. Uh, it was translated into 11 languages and reached all corners of uh, the Asia continent. Uh, next slide, please. So as I say that we reached all corners, we still only received over 600 respondents, <laughs> which is small for a, a region so vast. Um, also importantly, 
we received uh, 360, or the majority of our respondents came from Southeast Asia. So the results are, are weighted in that regard. Uh, the top three respondent countries uh, were Thailand, Malaysia, and uh, South Korea. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, deepening our appreciation of, of the, the results, we see that multilateral uh, people who work in multilateral organizations responded uh, more than other sectors. But the business sector was uh, right behind us, uh, and that was a surprise to some of us. Civil society uh, came in third. We know now that uh, in any future surveys, we need to target government, uh, academia, and students in greater measure. Thank you for the next slide, please. Uh, so this is the signature question of the survey. What's the most pressing environmental challenge for your country? Air pollution was a, uh, clearly came out uh, on top, followed by climate change and water pollution. It is incidentally why we have breakout rooms um, categorized under these environmental challenges. This is not to say that we won't be discussing soil pollution, uh, land degradation, biodiversity loss, and other risks, uh, environmental challenges. Uh, we just won't do so today. We're going to unpack those in future roundtables. Next slide, please. If we, if we disaggregate by region, you'll note here that uh, in Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia, this, the, the findings of, of what the most pressing environmental challenges are uh, reflect uh, the overall uh, results. Uh, so in both of those regions, uh, air pollution followed by climate change uh, were the priorities. South Asia, we see a more equal spread between the, the top three uh, with water pollution, uh, which is beating out <laughs> air pollution. It's not really a race, is it, a uh, uh, competition, but indeed uh, water pollution uh, uh, came out very strongly in South Asia over the other regions. Um, water pollution and scarcity had is over the other regions. Next slide, please. Uh, the most significant industry contributing to the environmental challenge, uh, agribusiness and energy uh, are amongst the, uh, well, the top two industries implicated in air pollution and climate change, perhaps no surprise there. In water pollution and scarcity, uh, we find uh, the waste management industry. Again, it explains why the breakout rooms are uh, titled as they are. I'm being told I have a one, one minute left, so I'm gonna speed to the next few slides. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a, a question that makes some human rights uh, experts cringe because uh, human rights are uh, interconnected and indivisible. And yet we thought we'd ask the question anyways because we we're putting our questionnaire out there to the general public. And we found that the, the right that was most implicated in these environmental challenges was the right to health. We think that's important, um, especially in this time of uh, COVID where the right to health is really ratcheted up uh, in terms of the importance uh, to, to governments and to others, uh, and to the general public. We think that maybe for advocacy purposes, uh, to leverage the right to health in our discussions about climate change and air pollution, et cetera, uh, is, is, is gonna resonate uh, greater than if we tag it to another right. Uh, again, we, we understand that there are complications with this ranking question. Um, so take the, the results as you may. Next uh, slide. I won't spend too much time here, but this is to showcase what you probably already uh, anticipated that those who selected, for example, biodiversity as the most important priority uh, tended to rank higher the right to land and territories over those of other areas. Um, again, you have the study, it's in the chat room for you to download. Uh, uh, take a, a closer look at this. I, I think these findings are interesting. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of the procedural rights intervention that's uh, most needed uh, to address to address environmental issues. We're seeing a great deal of consistency between the top three environmental challenge categories, access to information, inclusive decision-making, and access to justice. I might note too that the protection of human rights and environmental defenders also came out very strong. It just didn't hit that double digit or 10% threshold that we were looking for to, to put it in a separate category for all three, but it did come out rather strongly. Just not strong enough to make this final cut here. Second, next slide, please. What is the legal or regulatory intervention most needed to uh, address priority for environmental issues? Uh, and, and here we see a little bit more divergence, uh, but clearly uh, le a st stronger legal frameworks and enforcement uh, were the strongest, uh, is considered the, uh, the most likely, the most effective uh, thing that governments and multilaterals could, could emphasize, uh, could program around uh, to, to address these issues. And that's followed by um, 
environmental impact assessments, circular economy principles, environmental human rights due diligence. Uh, thank you very much. Next slide, please. And I see a question. Yes, we do have a country uh, wide breakout uh, breakups of the survey. We're going to produce a, another report uh, based on this, the findings today, but also uh, on a more disaggregated version of our of our data uh, to provide to you in the future. Uh, here's a here's a summary. I'm not going to read through all of it. Uh, just to reemphasize the last two bullets, because we will be focusing our discussion uh, in breakout rooms around these interventions. So keep information access to information, justice, and inclusive decision making, protection of environmental and human rights due diligence in mind, but also you know, environmental impact assessments, legal framework, circular economy, and, and due diligence work. Uh, that's it for my bit on the summary. Thank you very, very much for that. And now I think without further ado, I wanna turn it over to Georgina uh, to introduce our round table. Georgina. Thank you, Sean. And we're now moving to the part of the agenda where we will have our round table discussion. Um, I'm delighted uh, to introduce our, our participants in the round table and I would like to thank them again once more for their availability to join us today. So I will introduce all of them and then I will post the first question to our, um, our panel. We have joining us Bruno Bryan, who is the Executive Director of ACRR. We have Attorney Roberto Cadiz, a Commissioner from the National Human Rights Commission of the Philippines. We have Hamantha Bidange, who's the Executive Director of the Center for Environmental Justice in Sri Lanka. We have Shankar Venkateswaran from India, who is an advisor for sustainability, business and society and the co-founder of EQ Climate Finance. We have Victor Bernard, uh, who is a program officer with the regional Asia and the Pacific program of the Rao Wallenberg Institute. And finally, but certainly not least, we have Warasuk, who is a Mekong campaign coordinator on business and human rights advocacy for Earth Rights International. Um, it's quite an amazing panel and we look forward to the very interesting discussions. I'm, I'm going to start with a question which I'd like to start by posing to Commissioner Cadiz. And that question is, what are the views on the results of the survey and do they comport with your understanding of the regional priorities of business, human rights, and the environment. So first, uh, Commissioner Cadiz, over to you. Thank you very much, Georgina, and thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to this uh, roundtable discussion. Uh, I only have five minutes, but I feel it's important to preface my, uh, my comments uh, with, 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 some, uh, um, with some of the notes that I uh, jotted down uh, observing the survey results. Number one, I must emphasize that perception is different uh, from reality, of course, which we all know. Um, uh, second point is that ranking is really a very difficult and challenging process, especially in this case, because environmental challenges are really interrelated, uh, as well as the impacts uh, caused by, by these uh, challenges just as human rights are interconnected and indivisible. So it makes it very difficult to actually segregate and analyze the issues separately. Um, uh, and then I also observed that perception of the environmental challenges is more sensual, meaning connected with the five senses. And it's also very uh, local. It's locally contextualized as observed by Dr. Surya earlier. Uh, the, the, the impact and the, and the, the causes and the, 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 the perception will, will differ from region to region, especially, uh, for example, in, in the context of richer and uh, poorer countries. Uh, next observation is uh, some environmental challenges are less uh, perceivable by the senses, uh, as in the case of climate change. Uh, compared to, let's say, water pollution or air pollution, where you can see actual, you know, smoke uh, being emitted by factories. Uh, uh, another observation is that we, in regard to identifying causes, attributing causes to the environmental challenges, this is more education-driven than perception-driven. 
this is more an intellectual process rather than you know the uh, rather than experiential. Uh, well, a somewhat relevant observation is that I'm happy that the organizers, the designers of this, uh, have included climate change as part of the environmental dialogue, uh, because this is an emerging concept that climate change must be considered as part of the environment. And having said all this, uh, my general observation is that, uh, yes, the, the, the survey, the perception results is pretty much uh, close to to my own uh, perception and uh, observation and analysis. Uh, I note that the top three uh, uh, environmental challenges are air uh, pollution and uh, water pollution and uh, climate change. Um, now, in regard to uh, perception uh, concerning the specific to climate change uh, as the um, uh, drivers of this environmental challenge. Uh, I just want, to, well, it, it shows in the perception survey that the energy uh, sector is the number one culprit, then agribusiness, and then later on uh, infra uh, uh, industries. Uh, I, I just want to nuance this a little by saying that uh, uh, all these sectors by themselves uh, cannot be uh, purely accounted as accounted uh, or identified as purely responsible. For mm. example, in the energy industry, we have to consider uh, uh, that the, uh, the in, in relation to fossil fuel, uh, we must factor in, of course, the uh, behavior and the lifestyle and the global uh, uh, economist, economist dependence right now on, on mm. fossil fuel. And to say that uh, uh, um, uh, the energy sector is purely responsible just because they are the sellers uh, of, 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 of fossil fuel to the exclusion of the those who burn uh, fossil fuel just because there are no realistic alternatives might be a little uh, um, uh, unfair. Perhaps, yeah, perhaps it's unfair to, to implicate one industry more than the other. If also. there's a question, yeah, indeed. Uh, uh, Commissioner, uh, allow me to allow other speakers on, on the round table uh, right. a chance to reflect on these, uh, this powerful opening. In fact, I, I know that Bryn O'Brien is working closely uh, uh, with other advocates uh, with, on the, with the oil majors through shareholders. Um, quickly, Bryn, what, what are your uh, impressions of the survey? Um. My uh, impressions of the survey were that uh, I think um, Commissioner Cardiz got to it um, uh, during his remarks, but just that we need to really acknowledge that the um, causes of all of these um, uh, human rights and environmental issues of concern are primarily industrial. Um, so there is just the, the thing that the survey um, said to me so clearly was that um, the uh, the industrial processes, the relationship between corporations um, their, and their activities and human rights and environmental degradation is just absolutely central to this problem. Um, climate change is a problem largely of corporations. Um, it is a problem of industrial greenhouse gas emissions. So for the first time uh, in human history, we went over 420 parts per million of carbon dioxide just last month. The levels of methane, um, and methane is, a, is a, a greenhouse gas associated with the extraction of fossil fuels. The methane is a gas extracted. It is, it is, it is LNG, liquid natural gas, um, that the level, the concentration, the atmospheric of concentration of methane is spiking right now. And that is associated with the expansion of the oil and gas industry. So we are in um, a moment, an, an absolutely critical moment. Um, the causes of climate change, the causes of air pollution, but my, my expertise is, and, and focus is climate change. The causes of climate change are known to us and they are expanding. Oil and gas is, is the oil and gas industry worldwide is still expanding. My the country in which I, I live, Australia, um, is now the world's largest exporter of um, LNG and thermal coal, and 
there is no national regulation to constrain it. So, um, I, I mean, I'm happy to go on, um, but, but perhaps I'll stop there and, and create space for, for others to weigh in. Thank you, Bryn. Um, let's hear from other uh, roundtable uh, participants here. Would anyone like to reflect on uh, Commissioner Cadiz or, or Ms. O'Brien's? I see that Shankar has his hand up. Shankar? Yeah, uh, thanks, Sean. Just a quick uh, comment. I think I agree with uh, what Commissioner uh, uh, Cadiz and Bryn had said. Uh, and I would uh, uh, sort of say that a lot of it is is what one expected, but I was very pleased to uh, see that, as again, Commissioner Kedjian said, that uh, that the whole environment debate doesn't stop only at climate change, because that seems to be the dominant uh, point of discussion, that there are other issues also coming up. But I was actually struck by one thing in the solution side of, of, of the survey, uh, which is, you know, uh, there is obviously a greater need uh, for the for uh, you know, for more information, uh, you know, and that is uh, that is uh, indeed very important. But I was struck by the fact that uh, that the uh, expectation in terms of more corporate disclosures was actually not very high, uh, and I found that a bit uh, a bit puzzling because I would have thought that right information would also mean a lot more expectation of corporate disclosures. The other thing that I think is important is that apart from disclosures being more, especially from corporations, I think there is a case for a lot more analysis of those disclosures. One of the things I find with a lot of companies and I work with a lot of companies is that they complain that we, you ask us to keep disclosing, but you don't do anything and tell, and there's no feedback that's coming to us. And I think there's an important case for, for example, multilateral agencies to analyze what's coming out of these, these disclosures and feeding that back both to the companies as well as to policy making. And I think that is a piece that I would have, uh, I think is an important piece that I didn't see in this. So I'll stop there. Thank you, uh, Sean. Fantastic, fantastic uh, remarks. Uh, Hananta. Uh, please unmute uh, the button. Our, our actual facilitators. Uh, for help of there we are. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm I, I'm all, almost uh, um, in agreement with the other speakers. Uh, I think um, it, it gives a lot of uh, uh, information about how uh, people are thinking about. I'm very much interested about uh, the South Asia because South Asia put air pollution, climate change, and the water pollution as as top priority areas because of water pollution is one of the major major issue uh, in in many of our countries i think the most significant issues um, uh, i i think if if i refer to sri lanka the waste management is one of the major issue um, and and water pollution and air pollution as well from the industries but i might my, I'm wondering why we have got less uh, interest on the soil pollution because the soil, soil pollution is a slow killer and, and we are already talking about the plastics, microplastics and all the chemicals and everything ending in, 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 in the soil. Uh, perhaps air pollution is, has given much more priority in, in the international context and everywhere because of the climate change, etc. But the soil pollution has borders, and but people don't see them. Um, the microplastics in soil, so we don't see. When it comes to the uh, to the solutions, I think uh, it's right that access to information, access to justice, and all these are very very important. But I, as one of some of previous speakers mentioned, that corruption is one of the top leading issue in the business sector and the government sector regulatory sector which is actually harming which is not allowing us to bring this business and human rights uh, i mean respecting the business and human rights principles and also lack of law enforcement is a very big issue because law enforcement is expensive and 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 you cannot do it everybody can don't have the expertise and and such thing the capacity issue is is a major issue i think I would be happy to see that those things also bringing in, in, in this uh, um, uh, kind of survey. One last thing about, I think in, under the solution, again, we are thinking about EIE is going to solve everything. My experience in Sri Lanka has 30 year old, uh, actually, so we have introduced in 1993. Um, so the EIE has, it, it, there was a time, the first decade was okay, but soon after, so the EIA is just another legal tool, but without give, having, uh, helping, helping us 
uh, any major policy decisions or any major um, uh, decision taken. Um, so it's just a matter of uh, another legal approval. So I don't think trusting on the EIA is the, is the best. But if you have a, I mean, we have a very good in low legal system in Sri Lanka and India and all Nepal, Bangladesh, all of, all of these countries. If the law enforcement is going to make right, I think, um, I, including access to justice, et cetera, I think that will make much, much better. So I, I, I'll stop there. Thank you. It's really, really helpful in rounding it out. Why don't we uh, go to our next question and in fact, uh, and ask some of our other roundtable uh, discussants who haven't spoken yet to, to give a first crack at it. Um, thank you everybody for, for the interventions you made. Um, it, one of the concerns some of us have is, is before we start programs, before we start the you know, advocating for new policies, et cetera, does anyone here feel like there's already enough awareness of the interconnections between human rights and environment? Is this just a subject that we appreciate that is self-evident to us, or do we need to invest more in bringing, uh, building a stronger foundation of understanding? I see, I see Victor nodding his head uh, let me, okay, we'll start with Victor and then straight to Wara. Victor, maybe some, just a short remark and then right over to Wara if possible. Well, uh, yeah, I'll try to be brief, but thank you so much uh, for this question. Uh, from our engagement with the business sector, we have discovered that despite the recognition of the imperative role businesses play in addressing human rights, there is a significant knowledge gap uh, on human rights and how they're linked to the environment. Uh, this remains an impediment to, as you mentioned, implementing uh, programs, strengthening, for example, the respect for human rights as set out in the UNGP in environmental context. And I will showcase this knowledge gap from two angles. First, uh, the businesses in Asia that are aware of these interlinkages only have a limited understanding, especially of how human rights are adversely affected by unsustainable business practices within their particular sector and how such violations can be prevented mitigated and remediated. One reason for this, according to the businesses we have consulted, is that in spite of the available information on business and human rights, and more recently on the environment, most of these were described as predominantly led by international organizations coming from the West and disconnected from their operational uh, realities in Asia. Second, uh, the limited understanding of the interconnections between human rights and the environment would, for the most part, be confined to the CSR and HR departments. Without the buy-in from the leadership, progress towards strengthening this knowledge throughout the company and its supply chains will be insufficient to affect real change. So you asked me, do we need to first invest more in a, building a stronger foundation of understanding? I would say a resounding yes. But what is the best way to go about doing this? I would say building a stronger foundation needs to be led at the national level by business organizations, industry associations or chambers as they best understand their business members and the realities on the ground. RWI, for example, is currently working with uh, the Business Council for Sustainable Development in Malaysia, a CEO-led organization representing major Malaysian businesses on establishing a business-led human rights platform and a blending learning course that aims to enhance understanding on human rights and the environment. This Thank training you. will be, I'm just gonna sum up here. This training That's will great. be formed by a discussion brief we recently published on the on the right to healthy environment targeting the corporate sector, which was authored by Anisha, Ms. Anisha Rajapaksa, an international expert on business and human rights who's here with us today. I will share the link with you uh, through the chat, uh, chat function shortly, but I, I, I would like to pass the mic now to my peers. Thank Please you. do it, and you're, you're in good hands with uh, Anisha Rajapaksi. Um, we've worked with her as well. Uh, let me turn it over to Wara, please. Uh, what are your thoughts on this question, or, or indeed the question uh, beforehand, if indeed you had some comments? Thank you, Sean. I was just about to reflect on the first question. I think what I find the most like, striking for me is that, uh, first of all, the survey pointed out clearly that the human rights and environmental protection are interdependent, and at the same time, if the exercise of human rights, such as the right to access the information and the right to participation is of crucial to the environmental protection. That, that was be the, the answer for the first question. To lead me to the answer for the second question, in the area of business and human rights, what has been done so far is the attempt to integrate environmental risk challenges and human rights into the business agenda. But we don't get there yet. A lot of our advocacy at Advice International, we try to 
uh, change the perception and mindset of the business to be more responsible. For example, in the case of a coal mining and power plant project across Southeast Asia, that Earthrise has been engaging, uh, we see that there's a lack of understanding about the connection between environmental uh, risks and also human rights. And in order to build these two into the business agenda, there are a lot of efforts that we have to put in place. And advocating for the link is one of our like awareness raising, advocating for the link between environmental protection and human rights in, is, is of crucial and a big portion of our work. And uh, what if I, uh, which is very uh, strange for me, is that in order to address human rights issue and environmental risk, uh, the business had promoted CSR, corporate social responsibility, which has nothing to do with addressing human rights and environmental issues that emerge from the projects such as coal mining and power plant. And I see this as a challenge for us as a civil society to advocate for it. Thank you, Sean. Excellent. Excellent remarks from everyone. And, and indeed, I, I wish this roundtable could go on forever, uh, but we want to make sure we have time uh, for our audience uh, to participate. And, and it looks like we have uh, nearly 200 people uh, watching now. So, so I'm going to uh, now transition uh, from this roundtable format to the next format. And thank you, everyone, uh, for your views today. Uh, allow me to hand over the floor to Dory in a moment to help us with the breakout rooms. But before I do so, let me read off the titles and introduce you to our facilitators. Uh, first, we have the um, air pollution and agribusiness um, breakout room, and Georgina uh, will be facilitating that. Uh, climate change and the energy industry, uh, Livio Sarandrea, the global lead on business and human rights for UNDP, uh, will facilitate that uh, breakout room. And then water pollution and scarcity in the water uh, waste management industry uh, will be facilitated by Angela uh, Kariuki from uh, UN uh, Environment Program. Thanks again to our roundtable. We'll see you in the breakout rooms and then we'll see you back in plenary with some results uh, provided by our facilitators. Thank you, Dory. Take it away. Thank you, Sean. Um, so we're now moving to the breakout portion uh, of the event. You've been all been assigned to a room based on your stated topic preference during registration, and we'll move you into those rooms now. If you didn't specify uh, or don't remember specifying, you'll be assigned a random breakout room. Um, if you wish to change your room, please navigate to the bottom of the Zoom window, click on breakout rooms and hovering your cursor over the room of choice uh, and click join. If you're still um, not in a breakout room yet, you may have joined recently. So please wait for a moment as our technical team assigns you to a room. Uh, if you need any support for breakout rooms, please call the host into the room or return to the main room itself. Um, again, there will be a technical facilitator in each of the breakout room sessions. So uh, feel free to privately message them. Okay, and then uh, we will be opening the breakout rooms now. During this session, in order to capture the ideas of everybody, we're going to be using Mentimeter. Um, you may have used this already, uh, especially in this era of uh, virtual meetings. It, it's a good tool to um, capture ideas in a, in a sort of short period of time. So we're going to be using Menti or Mentimeter. You can either do that on your smartphone or you can open a browser window in your device, whatever you happen to be logged on to. Um, the technical facilitators are going to be sharing in the chat the mentimeter.com link. So what you can do is you can, uh, if you're opening a browser, you can go to mentimeter.com and then you enter the passcode into Mentimeter. So I will give everybody a little bit of time to do that. Um, on your phone, I think you would roughly do the same thing. Um, so Adesh, if you want to jump in and give any other technical directions, then please do do so. Hi, I've shared the link and the code in the chat. So if everyone could follow that link, uh, if you're having issues, please do um, write in the chat box. Thank you, Adesh. So please do go to the Menti uh, link. I'm trying to go there myself as well. <laughs> Multitask. 
Sorry, and then I when I click on it, it says that uh, the presentation is no longer active. I don't know if others are getting the same. I'm, I'm seeing same a message. few people vote. <laughs> I've seen eight. Can, okay. can you share that again, please? Can uh, you share yes. the link again, please? We'll do. So, yeah. so then I think what you need to do is go to menti.com and enter the code rather than use the, the full link. I think if you lose the full link, it. So the code is 72893333. Okay, so the first question that we're asking you to respond to through Mentimeter is a question that was posed to the, the panelists in the roundtable discussion. And that question is, what do you think of the survey results? Are they consistent with your expectations? So this is just a, a question that you can have four possible uh, answers to in this. It's yes, uh, yes, somewhat, not at all, or I'm not too sure. Um, unfortunately, with Menti, one of the limitations is it's, it is a bit limited in terms of the nuance in, in responses. Um, so we just have those four responses. Um, Adash, could you please project the, the results? All right. So we're seeing most responses going to yes, somewhat. I, it'd be great to tease that out a little bit. For those people that have said yes, somewhat, uh, does someone want to raise their hand and um, and give some thoughts on, on why, why somewhat. Uh, and if, if you're not um, speaking, I'll ask you to, to kindly mute yourself. Um, but if someone would like to take the floor and, and indicate why they thought uh, the results uh, somewhat met their expectations, please do so. You're, you're invited to, to share your thoughts. We've got about 14 responses now that have said that it does, uh, it is consistent with their expectations. No one's, be, no one's putting up their hands to speak. <laughs> Very quiet group. Um, I, can, I can pick on people who I know are here. All right, Matthew, please come in. Um, thank you, Georgina. So, so I thought it, it was consistent with expectations because of the importance of air pollution um, and that while there is a focus on climate change in general for business and human rights and the environment, it's become a big thing. For those of us working in environmental issues um, in terms of human rights issues, air pollution, land access, land degradation are actually more clear, clearly focused on, you know, specific, specific issues. So that's why I thought air pollution was, um, uh, and it's, it, it affects everyone's day-to-day -day immediate living, um, whereas climate change is still perceived as something that is uh, approaching or, um, or will get worse uh, over um, the, the short term to medium term. That's why I was thought it was appropriate. But I also made the point that um, agribusiness uh, in particular areas is the dominant thing, but in China and Vietnam and uh, other um, industrialized areas, um, it, it is in fact coal burning uh, and that, that is really the, the primary and, and motor vehicle transport and, and transport sector that do actually contribute more greatly to air pollution um, issues. Thank you. Thank you for those observations. And another interesting um, finding is uh, if we look at where um, the responses to the survey came from, there was an overwhelming responses that came from Southeast Asia. I um, mean, it may be that um, certain parts of Asia have different um, priorities in terms of, and um, perhaps, uh, what is 
exposed in terms of the topic of significance and importance at the moment uh, in different regions. Uh, Christine, please take the floor. Yes, so I'm Christine Wellington Moore. I am the SDG integration advisor for BRH for UNP um, in specific. Um, I actually answer somewhat, uh, not because I, I disagreed with anything that was there, but I think for me, what was ticking through my head, like right now I'm working on doing pilots, um, basically looking at doing, using systems approaches to get a better understanding of air pollution with an eye to, to mitigating air pollution, but not from the end of fight, but by transforming social economic models. And what I've realized so far, because we're now setting up what we call deep listening, which is where you're using system things to, to get more inclusive voices on the perceptions of what's driving air pollution. And because I, when I looked at the survey, I said, well, most of it is Southeast Asia. But from what I am seeing, it's more nuanced than that. It is very much depends on who has a voice and who points the fingers and who gets flagged the most in, um, in, in the media or, or in public perception. So I'm not surprised that climate comes up. I think, you know, the biggest thing, the most important thing and all of these things. But what we also know that the idea of having uh, inclusive decision-making, um, equitable access, whether it's access to uh, land, the right to, to have, a, to have some, some level of entrepreneurship, believe it or not. Um, there are many social factors that are currently out of whack that actually drive, in general, environmental uh, degradation and, and dirtier uh, practices. So, you know, I found that the results were interesting, but I couldn't help but wonder, apart from saying where, you know, Southeast Asia, which people were, were actually responding? Because I'm finding already that the perception of who is doing the most damage, if it's agribusiness, if it's coal, if it's whatever, uh, differs depending on who you ask. There's a lot of finger pointing. So I think that in looking at these results, we should also bear in mind that if you don't do a, a, a deeper dive into exactly who responded, was it CSO, was it private sector, was it big private sector versus small private sector, how many community level people, uh, small businessmen were interviewed, et cetera, um, I think that your results could look very, very different. So that was, that's just my comment. Thanks. Thank you, Christine. That's a really good point and the need to further disaggregate that data um, and, and do some deeper analysis based on disaggregated data is a really important point. Let's move now to the second question that is posed in the Mentimeter. Uh, and that question is, um, which of the following is the most important procedural rights interventions to address the impact of agribusiness on, on air pollution? Um, and the responses um, that have come in have indicated both uh, participatory and inclusive decision making, as well as protection of um, human rights defenders. Um, now, slightly tipped towards inclusive decision making. And um, you could uh, indeed uh, argue that in order to have inclusive decision making, you need to have um, full, fair, and effective participation, with, which includes enabling or having an enabling environment for defenders, for those that are speaking on behalf of the environment to participate in that decision-making process. Um, so that, that's a very interesting finding. And, and um, these also, it's, it's very tricky, at least it's tricky for me, um, really break uh, these uh, interventions because they all are fundamental. Uh, and in order to have uh, environmental rule of law, we need to see all an enabling environment that provides for all of these elements, um, which, which is um, very important, essential. Um, but by having inclusive participatory uh, decision making, it's an important start. So I would like to invite um, anyone to take the floor who would like to provide some context or expand upon their response to this question? If anyone would like to take the floor. 
Yes, please, Manas. Manas, you have the floor first. Hello, thank you. Uh, I'm in Mumbai, uh, India. Uh, so I, I voted for access to justice. Uh, and of course, all these are interconnected and you can't have access to justice unless you protect those who are fighting for justice and access to information and so on. But I feel that unlike some of the other ones, access to justice, uh, you know, very squarely discusses, in a sense, who is right and who is wrong. Uh, it gives us a chance to assess the frameworks that we use to decide what is right and wrong. And uh, somewhere along the way of being able to make these sort of very clear decisions, uh, you know, it becomes more actionable versus participatory decision making, you know, what does it really lead to at the end of it? Who is listening? Um, you know, who has a louder voice? So I, I felt that that was a good starting point. And then you can think about how to strengthen the others in order to support access to justice. Uh, and that might be a good way to go about it. So that is my thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Really important thoughts. And I, and I, I really um, take to heart the, the point that you just made, that you can't have access to justice unless you are providing an environment that protects those that are, that are seeking justice. Um, thank you. Denise, you have the floor. Hi, everyone. Oh, Denise. Sorry, <laughs> Denise Musni here. I'm speaking from the Philippines, um, from the Asian NGO Coalition. And I selected for this question, I selected, I selected inclusive decision making coming from the point of view of of, of uh, needing to recognize that when we speak of issues around the environment, business and human rights, we have to think of the communities who sh are supposed to be the main stewards of the environment. Therefore, if they are given a say in how resources are used and managed i think a lot of a lot of the um the problems that we're facing with regard to unsustainable uh, resource use um big plantations for example or even um um coal and and other energy projects that uh, contribute to climate change if they are given um, if they are given participation in the way that these are managed, if, if these resources are managed by them, um, then um, that could be a solution we could all pursue. Since anyway, there is already global recognition that when you provide um, smallholders, indigenous peoples, and cultural communities with the power to manage and govern over these resources, um, they actually have more sustainable uh, means for doing so. So that's from my end. Thank you so much, Denise, for, the, for those thoughts. And um, indeed, having um, strong community participation and, and ownership and is, is important in order to provide for sustainable outcomes and sustainable development. Um, Christine, uh, I see that you've raised your hand again. Is, this is a new hand. Yes? Yeah. Sorry. Yes, OK, Sorry. no problem, please. Uh, I, you know, I, I wanted to say, you know, the, the thing that I'm noticing also is that maybe it's because, you know, I'm working with and, and thinking in systems. And I actually think we're creating an artificial tension and an artificial need to choose an answer. Now, for example, I chose inclusive decision making, but I chose it not because I thought any of the others were unimportant, it's because that actually drives the others. If you have inclusive decision making, where you have all the cares of people involved, they can't make a decision unless they have access to information. If they're all speaking, they're going to talk about issues of inequality and injustice, therefore the access to justice issue comes up and an appropriate policy decision can be made to ensure that that happens and, and so on and so forth. And I think the next question you're going to see the same kind of artificial tension and I think that in dealing with these, these especially the reason we keep getting stuck on solving, I would say, all of the social and, and environmental management problems is that we keep fragmenting the, the drivers from the symptoms, right? So not having access to justice is a symptom of everybody not being included in decision making. Having not having everybody having access to information is a symptom of everybody not being included in decision making. So whenever I personally look at those things, I'm looking for what's the driver and what are the symptoms? And that's how I make my selection. So I think, you know, to get away from this angst of it's, you know, human rights or right to life or right to health versus, I actually don't think it's, it's versus anything. Um, 
maybe we should be changing how we look at things because every time you fragment, then resources, whether it's thought resources, financial resources, expertise keep getting fragmented. And then it becomes this competition that shouldn't be there and nothing moves. So that's why it's, I'm sorry to comment again, but I'm seeing it repeatedly. And I, I look at the next question, I can still see a similar um, a similar thing there. So it'd be interesting to see how people uh, choose on the next question. But I just wanted to make that comment. No, it's an sorry, talk again. Talk again. No, thank you very much. It's an important point to make because it, it, by creating um, this requirement for people to choose, it is implying that they're competing choices. And, and it's not, it, it shouldn't be that they are competing choices. All of these are important elements that need to be considered. And, and your point about drivers and symptoms is also well taken. Uh, I'll hand the floor to Suryana, sorry, pronounce it correctly, Suryana, uh, and then we'll move on to the, the last question. Thank you, Georgina. Uh, I just want to echo what Christine has just mentioned. I think that um, there shouldn't be like sort of a, a choice for us to make or it can be a situation whereby we have uh, multiple choices and then maybe we can go um, by, by, by way of prioritizing, let's say, you know, um, maybe access comforts or justice comforts, depending on how you rank it. Um, the other additional point I wanted to ask with regards to the survey is that for, for instance, when you talk about inclusiveness, um, do you also um, make the separation for gender participation in the uh, decision making? Thank you. Thank you so much for raising that because I want to come back to this need to have gender responsive and inclusive uh, solutions at everything. So absolutely, there is a need to ensure um, that all responses and solutions that are determined are, are determined in such a way that recognize the unequal vulnerabilities of different groups and ensure that they are gender responsive. So let's, let's come back to that in just a moment, but let's move to the last uh, Mentimeter question. So Adash, if you can give us the results. Can you move to the next question, Adesh? It's still on the procedural rights. Okay, all right, thank you. So uh, the majority of the responses have selected stronger legal frameworks and enforcement. And this is continuing to be the trend. Um, for me, this, this is not very surprising working in the field of environmental law and governance. Um, I mean, it is a trend that was identified within the global environmental rule of law um, reporting that was done in 2019 and again is being done this year, that the issue uh, is the enforcement of uh, laws and uh, not that laws don't exist, but the failure to implement and enforce those laws. That is one of the biggest um, downfalls in terms of environmental rule of law. I cannot see my participant list suddenly, but oh, here we go. I would like to invite if anyone would like to speak to this point. Yes, please. Thank uh, you. Serena, yes. <laughs> it's me again. Uh, why I voted for that is because in my three years of course of work in the palm oil sector, I often realized that human rights um, uh, abuses happen and I attribute it primarily to the lack of enforcement. Uh, nonetheless, in the context of Malaysia, as you all know, uh, we, have go we have gone through a political change, a political yo-yo. So uh, there was a political, not instability, but you know, when you have a political change from one regime to another, it would entail a change of policy decision, as well as allocation of funding. So uh, that's why I, 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 I put forward, this is my preferred choice. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, important, Benita, and, I, and I'm sure it would not just be the palm oil sector in which this is a, a significant reflection. 
Um, it may be in, in a number of others. I mean, Victor, in the um, panel, you spoke about uh, the, the fact that there is this disconnect between awareness and understanding amongst the, the business sector of the implications of uh, environmental degradation, environmental risks and, and human rights. And, and I think that um, perhaps that influences also the issues around failure to enforce um, because this lack of awareness and, and understanding um, means that there is not enough emphasis placed on the importance and the, and the significance of effective enforcement and implementation. Is, would anyone else like to take the floor before we move to our final question? I, uh, yes, Matthew. Um, thank, thank you, Georgina. Um, and, and I want to just very briefly talk about this in a, in a Thai or an ASEAN context on, on air pollution. Um, and this is, while I've, this was also something that I supported is, is, is the enforcement of existing laws. And in most countries, especially in Southeast Asia, there are already existing laws on that could manage air, air pollution and air quality. In Thailand, for example, government could declare an emergency under Thai, the existing Thai law, um, and that would require, and they can impose strong actions. Um, in China, the way they, in Beijing, responded to air pollution while they enacted a new law, they also implemented the law, made it functional. Um, and so the enforcement of the law was quite important in reducing air pollution. Again, that was mostly industrial um, through coal burning for heaters and, and coal-fired power plants. Um, within Southeast Asia, with respect to haze and agricultural burning and, and, uh, and forest destruction, there are most of these activities uh, are able to be responded to by existing laws, but there is not the will of the governments to actually enforce those laws. In Thailand, we're focusing on trying to get a new Clean Air Act through, um, but at the same time, that distracts on actual action, um, both in urban areas and rural areas, to actually address the issues of, of air pollution. And, and I think that's the same in. in countries such as Indonesia and, and Malaysia. Singapore itself has the Hayes Act, which is some of the strongest legislation, environmental legislation worldwide to deal with air pollution and Hayes issues. So the laws are there, they're just not being enforced uh, effectively or at all um, by governments. And that's a curious thing as to why that is not the case, given such a level of community concern about um, air pollution in general. Thanks, Matthew, for that intervention. I mean, one further reflection would be that we're talking about business and human rights, and we should be looking also to, to business solutions and, and ways to engage business uh, to put in place um, systems and policies and procedures that maybe through human rights due diligence will ensure that there are fewer violations of rights in the process of, of running business or doing business. Um, I want to move to our final question. And we have about five minutes uh, before we move back to the plenary. And this question really speaks to the point um, that was made before about gender and the importance of ensuring that there are uh, gender responsive interventions. So can you please uh, share through the chat function, uh, what are the gender dimensions of the interventions that have been suggested? And what should multilateral entities and government do to ensure that women's voices are heard, that women's leadership is empowered and perspectives are considered? Understanding the importance of uh, addressing the unequal implications uh, for women and girls of environmental rights violations. I think this is an, an incredibly important point. Uh, the evidence tells us that women and girls are much more vulnerable to, to violations of rights, that they often have even less access to information, even less opportunity to participate uh, than others. 
of course, uh, women and girls are not the only uh, vulnerable group, and there's a need to ensure that all policies and interventions address the needs of all vulnerable groups, that they are some of the most vulnerable. Um, so please uh, put into the chat box some suggestions for how we can ensure that interventions, whether that be through improved implementation and enforcement of laws, whether it be through enabling inclusive, uh, fair, equitable participation in decision making, how can we make sure that that is gender responsive? Uh, we only have one minute. I see the message from Dory. So if you can take 45 seconds to please give us all of the amazing answers, uh, that would be uh, fantastic. Thank you. I see some responses coming in. When we go back to the plenary, we will be reporting back from our group discussions, a very quick level, unfortunately, summary of our, of our, in, our discussions. But note that everything that has been said um, has been taken down and will feed into the subsequent report and the subsequent uh, determination of appropriate work that we can continue to do in this, in this area. So before we move back to the um, plenary, please let me say thank you to everyone for, for joining the discussions. Really appreciate um, all of the inputs and, and very glad to have had the opportunity to talk uh, this afternoon. Good afternoon and uh, a warm welcome <clears throat> to all those uh, participating to the breakout room on uh, climate change and the uh, and, uh, uh, energy industry. Uh, I'm Livio Sarandrea and I will be uh, the facilitator of this uh, particular thematic area. I don't know if the technical facilitator also wants to introduce herself, or maybe I will do that uh, we have, we have, with us, Kavya, that will help us. And we also have a note taker, Belinda, that will be taking some notes. Um, we have only half an hour, uh, even a little bit less, if we have to stick to the program that I was given. And we have 48 people. I'm gonna try to speak uh, as little as possible and have as many of you speaking. However, the time is limited. So uh, as, as a way to collect as much inputs as possible from all of you, we're gonna be running uh, three Mentimeter uh, questions where you can all give your inputs. And uh, at the end of each of these three questions, I'll open up uh, for discussion and for brief intervention from Two of you, you can actually start raising your hand if you um, if you want to um, speak, uh, and, and I'll be monitoring that. Uh, try again to give the floor to as many people as possible. Hopefully, your intervention will relate to uh, the specific question that we are posing. The first one is a very general one, uh, so I will welcome very general comments after we run it. So if Kavya can help me in, in um, uh, showing the first question and giving uh, instructions to those participating on how to vote on Mentimeter. Most of you are probably familiar with it, but it will be useful, uh, Kavya, if you can uh, give instructions. Thank you, Livio. Hello, everyone. As you can see, the Mentimeter question is on your screen now. To answer, please go to www.menti.com and type in the code that you see in your screen or the one that I've shared in the chat box. Thank you. As you are doing that, I will, uh, <clears throat> I will, I will explain that obviously what we're trying to do with this question is to validate also uh, the result of the survey. Some of you may have actually participated in the survey. Some might have not. Uh, some might have uh, changed even their views uh, 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 on the basis of the comments that were made. Uh, but again, we look forward to uh, this map being populated. We see that it's being uh, very rapidly populated. Uh, um, 
strongly on the yes somewhat and some yes, but I, I will let uh, as many as possible of you uh, voting um, so that we have a bigger group of views reflected here. We have 45 people joining this session and I see that this, about half of you have already voted. So I will give it a little bit more of time and then I'm going to ask uh, those who want to intervene to raise the hand or, 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 or flag it in the chat. Um, again, those who want to intervene on making any point of general nature at this stage uh, with, with this question that we see on the screen as a basis, right? So are the, are the survey results consistent with your expectations? It's a little bit of a similar question was already asked to the panelists again, any of you that wants to come in uh, on this particular question should uh, feel free to raise the hand and, and make an intervention. I'm going to be monitoring both the chat and uh, the participant function where, again, I believe, please confirm uh, Kavya, all participants um, are able to use the raise hand function. Is, is that correct, Kavya? Yes, that is correct. They are also able to unmute themselves and turn on their videos and share any intervention in the chat box. Right. Okay. So I do not see any hand raised at this stage. Um, Kavya, the, the participants that I see on my list are those of this particular session, right? Not the entire group. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. All right. So uh, obviously, I mean, the, the first comment that can come from me is that the the, the input that we have received, uh, uh, it, it's quite clear. Uh, most of you uh, found, found that the result of the survey somewhat are consistent with, uh, uh, with their views, with their perception. I hear somebody, is there somebody that wants to intervene? Please feel free to take the floor. Otherwise, um, I will perhaps to break the ice and 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 by encouraging you all to come in with uh, any view and inputs. I, I can see that actually people are still voting. Are we gonna close? Uh, you suggest we close soon, uh, um, Kavya, this poll. We have around 27 people who voted out of 48. I think is a good sample. Sure. I will. I'll leave it, I will leave it there on the screen for those that want to intervene and comment on it. I, I do not see at this stage uh, anybody will raise the hand to speak. So I, I, what I will do, um, I will give the floor back uh, to, to Roberto Cadiz, to Commissioner Cadiz, uh, whose points uh, I, I very much appreciated at, at the opening and I, and I felt uh, uh, that I, I've actually got out with the feeling that I would like to hear even more uh, from him. And then, of course, I'll ask uh, uh, Brin to, to uh, be prepared as well to come in. Oh, I do see also Brin that wants, uh, has raised her head. So why don't I give the floor to uh, uh, Brin and, and then uh, perhaps Roberto or any other. Uh, so let us start uh, from Brin. You might want to expand uh, the comments that you have already made. The floor is yours. Thank you, Livio. Thanks, everyone. Um, so I wanted to the, the question that I actually wanted to attack was was really um, a, a, the, the more more towards the, the the second one about you know even in considering whether the results are consistent with um, expectations, we really need to consider um, the um, interlinkages between human rights and um, environment um, issues and how difficult it is to actually explain those to some audiences. So I'm going to attack it in, in two ways. First is the at the conceptual level. Um, across the region, um, uh, climate change, um, extractives capitalism um, and consumerism are all, there. there is a, a real linkage um, to the fundamental human rights violations to do with colonisation. It's certainly an enormous um, enormous and very obvious linkage in, in Australia. 
Um, and so that's a kind of at a conceptual level, these things are very much interrelated. In terms of the difficulty of explaining these interlinkages to some audiences, my job is to go ahead and, uh, and talk to um, investors um, and to companies about human rights impacts and climate change. And the task of trying to explain to oil executives that um, their climate impacts are actually directly relatable to human rights impacts is a really difficult one. They tend to, their kind of mind gets blown by that interlinkage. And I, and I you know, I wondered if Commissioner Cardi's, um, I know that, he, you know, his, his work on the commission has been really groundbreaking in that regard, um, in, in just establish, establishing that interlinkage, but really at a business and investor level, it is so poorly understood, absolutely terribly understood. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much for deepening that point, uh, Brian. I'm, I'm going to give the floor very rapidly to uh, uh, Commissioner Caris if he, if he wants. Oh, I, I, if he wants to add something, and then I'm keen on going to the second question that it will be uh, more focused and perhaps will inspire more comments uh, from the floor. Uh, but perhaps very briefly, uh, Commissioner Caris, if you if you also want to come in, uh, two minutes. Thank you very much, Olivia. Uh, the challenge right now to, to the global economy is to have it transition from dependence on fossil fuel to clean energy system. This is the challenge. And the crime of the energy sector is that it has exerted all its efforts to obstruct this transition to clean energy by through campaign financing, supporting politicians, encouraging certain governments to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. But right now we have to recognize that, for example, in my country, if you say that, uh, that the, the, the uh, energy sector should no longer sell fossil fuel, our economy will shut down and it will result into terrible negative human rights impacts. That's why we are saying in our commission that the challenge is not that the crime of the industry is not so much in the selling of fossil fuel, because right now we depend on it, but their crime is blocking this transition. And the crime of some governments is providing subsidy to the energy sector in, and tax incentives instead of supporting the development of clean energy. I just want to clarify that. And uh, we have identified many, many acts committed by the energy sector where that, that, can be sub, that can subject themselves to criminal and civil action. That's extremely clear. And I, I believe it's a very, very, very good point, uh, Commissioner Cadiz. Thank you very much for that. I'll ask Kavya to go to the second uh, question. And uh, again, we'll ask you to vote, use a Mentimeter. So which of the following uh, is the most important proce procedural rights intervention to address the impact of energy industry on climate change. Uh, what you see in here is the result of, of the survey and we will ask you now to vote uh, on, on your own uh, views. And again, I think, uh, uh, yeah, or, or, or perhaps, Kavya, please, uh, is, is, okay, sorry, this is already the result of the voting that is coming in from you, okay. So we see that this is, again, um, the votes are coming in. I see inclusive decision-making uh, with more votes than any other. And if I'm not wrong, this is, this, there's a difference in, in, in this case from uh, what we had seen uh, in, the, in the survey. Uh, largely access to information, access to justice, inclusive decision-making is, is very, is very high. I'll give it a little bit more of time for more of you to vote, if you wish. Uh, we have already a good number of votes, but uh, there's 53 people in this uh, breakout room. So just a little bit more of time. I see one more vote for inclusive um, decision-making. Uh, obviously uh, a very, very important issue and one that was pointed out actually by by Professor, Duvia, uh, uh, Professor uh, Surya and by many of the speakers, right? All right, so I think the, the views are really taking uh, good shape. I see now access to information, access to justice, uh, 
uh, being uh, the same level and again inclusive decision making being by far um, the, the most voted. So the views are already quite clear. We, we, we could keep it uh, um, going as if some of you want to keep voting uh, while we speak, but I think I can already uh, encourage comments uh, from the floor on this. Um, please do feel free to come in. Uh, I, I, I recognize also some of you that are here and I know there's many people that <clears throat> can contribute to these points or more broadly to the discussion if you don't want to speak specifically to this question. <clears throat> I see also Kunsor there, I see many of you. Uh, if there are no hands raised, I'll, I'll, I'll again uh, leverage the presence of uh, the two experts, though I, I think there are many of you here who are experts beyond uh, uh, Commissioner Cadiz and Embrin uh, here with us. Okay, I do see Romchat raising her hand and I'm very happy to give the floor to Romchat. And I do see also Cynthia, so first Ramchat and then Cynthia. Ramchat, you have the floor. Thank you, Leo. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ramchat from OSCSR. And I just want to, to share my response to this question. I, I, and I vote for the answers of the other. I am one of the two in the, the red result. And the reason why I, I choose this answer is because I cannot choose among the other three issues, because uh, in my point of view, and OSSR has been working on the climate, the rice based, human rights based approach to the climate action. And I would like to clarify at this room as well that the energy industry should be included, uh, should include the renewable energy as well. And I, as mm. far as, uh, as per my observation, the issue in the area of climate change is the, the impact, the adverse impact of all of the renewable energies in the Southeast Asia. And uh, many, many of the mega development projects is conducted under the name of the climate change. And there's a lot of many uh, business actors including the safe on enterprise has been involved in this kind of projects and without the access of information many many issues uh, arise because the local communities don't know the technical issue of this kind of projects and inclusive decision making is of course this is a very serious issue in the region many, many of the local communities, leaders and civil society who stand against this project has been harassed or criminalized because of their, 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 their voice and their, their actions. And of course, the access to justice, many, many failure of this kind of uh, renewable energy projects has that, that impact the local communities. Many of them never receive any compensation. So that is my response here, that why I cannot choose among the four of these answers. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very good point. It will be made uh, uh, when I report to the plenary. Um, let me now ask Cynthia to come in with a reflection as well. Cynthia, you had the floor. Uh, yes, I very much agree with the findings here that inclusive decision-making is, is pivotal. Um, as, as the most important procedural rights intervention. Um, but that's almost preemptive and that's in a not utopic world, but one that doesn't quite yet exist in terms of common practice. And so next to that, I'm, I'm rather surprised that the protection of human rights defenders um, receive such uh, little attention in comparison, um, particularly if we're looking at this region where under uh, increasingly authoritarian regimes, um, the number of environmental defender killings have increased uh, significantly. I think there was over 63 human rights defenders killed in the Philippines in 2017 alone. 
Um, and yeah, and, and also there's a lot of tensions, not just with regards to mining and, and things that we know well, but it's also happening to some degree. I think I've seen in India uh, where it's happening in, in the case of when large solar parks are being opened uh, for the purpose of renewable energy. So I'm, I guess I have a question around what is the role of um, you know, uh, organizations like UNDP and others to help support when governments themselves may not be in the optimal position to help protect the human rights defenders and companies are not yet quite sure of their role in helping that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia, for for, uh, for for your contribution, it is surprising. It was surprising indeed not to see human rights defenders among uh, the first that were voted, right? When the survey was run, was included as a question. It did come close to be among the, the first uh, uh, five. As a matter of fact, I think it was the sixth, and that's perhaps why it wasn't in particular uh, uh, poll. But yes, it was surprised to many that it was not picked by many as, uh, as being higher in that. And human rights defenders, we are aware, is uh, obviously um, a very big issue. Uh, there is a number of actions that our program is taking to support human rights defenders. I, forgive me if I you know, wouldn't use the, the time, the little time that we have allocated in here to come back to you on that. And, and I certainly deserve an opportunity to come back to you and explain uh, all the different actions that we are taking, but it's well registered both uh, your concern about uh, not enough emphasis in this poll and in general on human rights um, defenders. I see that Robert has also raised his hand. So Robert, I'm very happy to give the floor to you as well uh, from the Office of the Commission for Human Rights based uh, in Fiji. Robert, you have the floor. Hi, good. Hi, Buller, and good evening to everybody from uh, Fiji. Just want to share a few points that you know uh, on the discussions that uh, from the previous session, but also this, looking at you know some of the areas of concern. Uh, we here in the Pacific uh, work on climate change and making the linkage between business and human rights. So it's something I've been working on for the last couple of years, and I think um, you know one of the thing that really stands out for me uh, in terms of the uh, access to information. Is kind of unpacking the the, the linkage between uh, freedom of information under Article 19, uh, the International Covenant uh, Civil and Political Rights. I mean uh, that actually talks about you know um, you know uh, the freedom to seek, receive, and uh, impart information. So that can be the guidance I think when working with business to actually share information with people who are actually affected on the ground. As my colleague Ramchit said. I mean, more from what we see actually in the Pacific, uh, which is similar to Asia, of course, in terms of, say, seabed mining or these kind of large extractive industries, is that there isn't often a human rights-based approach taken. And if it is, it's generally a company greenwashing. So saying that they've actually done some engagement with the communities, but not actually doing it in uh, reality and not, and certainly not in, in terms of the FPIC principles, so free prior informed consent with local communities. And so I think what we've tried to do really in the way of inclusive decision making and raising concerns for access to justice and human rights defenders, really speak to business uh, associations and work with businesses to show that uh, climate change and environmental uh, degradation should be seen as well as a risk assessment for companies as well. So looking at ways in which actually this could harm your company if you don't take into the account these kind of assessments. So I really liked what uh, Bryn said as well about, you know, the, the colonial aspects that we see from some of the countries as well. Uh, we recently did a, a workshop on climate change and indigenous peoples. And of course, this is a concern raised um, constantly by indigenous peoples where often their lands encroached, uh, you know, when mega projects take place, I'm sure you see that across Asia. Uh, and you know it's going on in Thailand and other countries um, across Southeast Asia. So I think that's something to take on board as well. I just say the other things I wanted to mention was, you know, um, the Green Climate Fund has a redress mechanism where, you know, when the climate projects take place. And so that, that is one, one avenue for environmental human rights defenders to use to raise complaints. Similar with the OECD, I mean, in my region, it's only... Um, uh, Australia and New Zealand, but you know, for Asia, it could be Japan or Korea, where you could raise things, uh, concerns with the national contact points as well. So often when there's cases in the Pacific, say in Fiji and it's an Australian company, we have used that avenue to raise uh, concerns as well. So thanks very much, Leo. 
Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Very, very constructive point, including recommendations that I took note of it and I will report. Uh, certainly good dimension of, of, of the Red River mechanism, the NCPs, I'll add to that, the national human rights institutions. Again, we could have a whole event discussing to which extent this uh, old bodies have the actual capacity of making a difference, but absolutely, those are all good uh, uh, points. Um, and I'm, I will probably ask Kadia to go to the third uh, um, Mentimeter question. I have an open question at the end if we have time, but let's at least go through the three centimeter questions. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask you to vote. In fact, I, perhaps some of you have already voted. Uh, that's my understanding, right? Uh, and uh, we can allow a little bit more of time for people to vote, after which I'll, I'll ask more people to come in uh, with, their, with their comments. Uh, if I can ask Ram, Chat, Cynthia, and Robert if they may to lower the hand, but I, otherwise I and, and 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 in fact raise it again if they want to speak uh, on the second question uh, as well. Um, and again, encouraging others who haven't spoken to comment of the question that we are seeing here. I'll read it. Which of the following is the most important? legal regulatory intervention to address the impact of energy industry on climate change. So the circular economy principles, the environmental impact assessment, the environmental and human rights due diligence, or stronger legal frameworks and uh, enforcement. So, a little bit more time, there's obviously most of you that went into stronger legal framework and uh, informant, so a strong preference for that one. Um, it's, and I see a comment in the chat from um, Rin, it's, it's quite, uh, and you can all um, read it and perhaps I'll ask her to come in and, and make the comment uh, by opening up her microphone if there aren't people that are raising their hands and want to come in. I also see uh, Vicente that is commenting. So um, I'll ask Brain to come in and, and make a point, which I think is very valid, and then ask Vicente yeah. to flag uh, if he also wants to take the floor and, and speak. Floor is yours. So um, I, I couldn't agree more that with, with so many of the participants here that stronger legal frameworks and enforcement are absolutely essential. and law and regulatory action needs to be taken at, at every level from kind of um, state uh, state sub subnational governments, national governments, um, as well as global trade sanctions. That's a, again, another kind of enforcement mechanism for recalcitrant countries like Australia. Um, the comment in the chat was about the way that countries in, in the global north like Australia uh, use the equitable transition argument, so a just transition for workers, as well as um, kind of issues of global equity uh, and, and energy poverty as um, uh, the Australian government and fossil fuels lobbyists call it, to delay transition, to delay um, the window of acceptability of fossil fuels companies extracting fossil fuels from the ground and selling them to be burned. Um, uh, you know, and that it is just a, it is a really deeply, deeply cynical argument and quite perverse in the way that um, a lot of those fossil fuels then get burned in the global north, um, even though the, the, the argument is that, you know, that they need to be sold um, to the global south. And um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. And I, and I actually see um, uh, Kun Sor and Shankar that also raised their hand. Uh, Sor hasn't spoken yet. Kun Sor, uh, you, uh, business and human rights activist from Southeast Asia, based here in Thailand. Uh, Kung Sorn will uh, uh, look forward to uh, your, your reflections. Please just open your mic and come in. Thank you, Livio. Uh, I just want to make the comment. I agree with the stronger legal framework and enforcement because even we have a good law, but if the enforcement is not is not used or there is a gap to use the law that is uh, very difficult to uh, to control for the impact or for the preventing the impact 
on the climate chain. And because of the energy industry, actually the government used to support for this, uh, this activity, this project in everywhere. It's not only in Thailand, but I know that everywhere on most of the energy industry invested joining with the government or the government support, then it's very difficult for enforcement whenever the government uh, support this, pro this project. Then it's linked to the, the previous que uh, question that we need the, uh, the, the participation for the people that everyone should uh, have to join for the making decision. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to control for the energy industry. And yes, the effective of the energy industry is uh, the climate change. And <laughs> because of, even we have a very good uh, EIA system, but if the EIA system is just not enforced or not have very like a strong uh, legal framework, is also nothing. It seems like it's nothing for the uh, controlling or protecting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kunsar. Um, I, I'm, I'm flagged by, by the, the main facilitator that we have uh, about a minute left. So uh, with the permission from Shankar, who has already spoken as a panelist, uh, I'll give the floor to Vicente, who has also uh, raised his hand, and then come back to Shankar if we have time. Apologies, Shankar. Uh, so Vicente. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Sorry, I don't have the video, it's depicted. But anyway, I would like to raise this with the panel. First, two points only. Uh, we, we've been waiting for almost two years on the case filed against with the carbon major emitters in the Philippine Commission on Human Rights. But until now, uh, uh, we never received yet the, the resolution of the case. And uh, the petitioner there are the Philippine Movement for Climate Justice. That's one point. Second point is uh, we cannot move on in, into the energy transition not unless this uh, international financial banking institution should uh, stop from uh, funding My name is Angela and I'm very happy to facilitate this discussion today. Um, I'd also like to just ask everyone to please introduce yourselves in the chat box. Uh, you can share your name and affiliation just so that we know who's in the room today and in case participants would like to connect with each other. So during this uh, discussion, we'd very much like to get your feedback on a couple of questions related to the Business, Human Rights and Environment Survey. So um, as Sean said, we'll be using Mentimeter to help us be a bit more efficient in collating our feedback to these questions. So I think I'll just go straight to the first question um, and hopefully Prabina will have joined us. We'd really like to get your thoughts on the survey results. You know, what do people think of the survey results? And are they consistent with your expectations? Um, let me now ask Prabina if, if she's in the room um, to present the question. Prabina, please. Thanks. Just saw her. I just saw her in the chat <laughs> putting yep. something else up. Uh, oh, there she is. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Pravina. Okay, so we go to mentimeter.com. Is that right, Pravina? Uh, yes, I just, uh, I've just put the details on the chat as well. I'm sending it again. Um, it would be the link and the code is also there. 4463-8275. Sorry, I'm going to turn, mute myself, otherwise I'm going to, I'm so, <laughs> terrible. I'm so sorry, it's so typical, sorry, go ahead. No problem. So if anyone's having any um, sort of technical issues, Prabina is also on hand to assist, um, but I think it's uh, quite easy. Just go to the link, enter the, the code and click your response to the question.
and thank you to everyone who's already um, introducing themselves. That's really great. So I think we have around 15 responses. So I recall there were around 40 in our room, maybe just a little bit longer. Yeah. And the link is available in the chat box in case you haven't seen it, please just uh, check the chat box and, and go there to select your response. So now we have about half of our participants who've, um, who've already entered their response in Mentimeter. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for selecting your responses in the Mentimeter um, question. I think the results are, are really quite interesting, um, and I'd really like to hear from participants. So maybe I can take a comment from one of our participants. Just, you know, your reflections on, on these results of this particular Mentimeter question. I know we're, we're, we're short on time, so um, I don't want us to take too much time. So maybe I can just take one comment. Um, from one of our participants, please feel free to, to raise your hand or um, just uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and, and make your comment. And of course, the, the chat box is open. If you want to share your comment in the chat as well, please uh, feel free to do so. Let's see if there are any hands. Joy, um, I see Joy has raised their hand. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I joined the discussion and it is very uh, helpful in Bangladesh also. Because you know that Bangladesh is a developing country and a lot of corporates and private companies are entering in development activities, especially on biodiversity, uh, climate and environment. So there are a lot of, uh, lot of uh, lack of uh, regulatory uh, to uh, monitor these things and also a lot of system uh, to conserve or protect them uh, for this. So this kind of initiative is very important and also to monitor these activities and make them accountable is very important. So a lot of activities like this kind of survey is also important in Bangladesh and uh, we need this kind of initiative also can uh, introduce in Bangladesh to make them accountable and keep climate in control. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joy, for, for keeping your response um, short and within the time. Um, and please, colleagues, uh, feel free to continue uh, sending in your comments uh, to, this, to this particular question using the chat function. Um, I think we'd, we'd be uh, ready to move on to our second question. And again, I'll ask Prabina to share the second question. And it's really focused on which of the following important um, procedural rights interventions to address the impact of waste management Okay, there we go, on water pollution and uh, water scarcity. So again, the, the code, I think, uh, the link and the code are the same, if that's correct, Prabina. And colleagues can again go to the Mentimeter. I see the results coming in.
I think I saw a message from someone saying that the, the link wasn't working for them. Hopefully they were able to, to access it now. I think that's Asha who had said that the link wasn't working. So Asha, please, I hope you've been able to log in and uh, make your selection. There may Again, be more to start. talk about on, on this one, Angela. Maybe um, with inclusive decision-making pulling so far ahead, we could go ahead and ask some questions and people can continue to, to add their results. Yeah, I think that's a good idea, Sean. Thank you so much. So again, uh, participants, um, I'd like to hear your feedback on this. I think it's quite interesting that uh, many, well, the majority of participants have selected inclusive decision-making as the most important procedural rights intervention. And I'd like to hear some reflections on, on you know, possibly why this, this is something that's so important. So again, let me open the, the floor. If you'd like to, to make a reflection, Maggie, Maggie, that was very quick. And Maggie, please go ahead and share your thoughts with us. Thank you, Angela. Great to see you again. And hi, Sean. Yeah. Um, representing uh, WWF and VERA, which is also an environmental standards body, we are seeing a growth of environmental standards that are being written and um, also implemented as we speak. Some of them may be about seafood, plastics, and different uh, um, environmental aspects. And I think that while these standards are being written, it's extremely important for us to actually have individual groups, especially the informal sector for, uh, for plastics recovery, for example, um, to have um, representation in the decision-making process. Um, there could be consultations, um, there could be quite a lot of stakeholder management meetings that may not actually reach uh, the, the workers who are actually being impacted the most when these standards are being implemented implemented in each one of these countries. So that's uh, really um, something that came from also my UNEP days um, when we were also working on uh, recovery of plastics and also marine litter. Um, decision making process usually um, has a very big hurdle in terms of finding the right representatives who would be speaking for the informal sectors and also um, uh, an element of gender uh, representation as well. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you Angela, so much, I, Maggie. Yeah, Sean, go ahead. Just that, yeah, Maggie, appreciate those comments. And, you know, one of the funny things about inclusive decision making is, is also how much the, the business sector, when they respond to this question, how, uh, how, low, the, how low they rank this. Uh, this is not their favorite area <laughs> uh, to be working. Um, and I do know that some of them have been, um, well, they feel from their perspective that, they, that they, it, was, it was a very rough experience. Uh, I think your comment about having proper facilitators is a really important one. Uh, when business tries to uh, approach communities, uh, they need to do so with the right facilitator. That, that trust element for both sides is, is, is often lacking. Um, and yet when they plow through it and then they're surprised when, um, you know, the, 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 the consultations, the dialogue that should lead to decision making are not informed. Uh, by, by either, from their view again, the science or the data they're putting forward, or in fact, they're saying, some of them are saying that um, decision-making processes um, are, are flawed and sometimes politicized. Um, these, are, this is, these are not my views. I'm just trying to add their voice uh, to the conversation of, of why inclusive decision-making is really important for most of people, most of the people attending today, uh, but might, uh, might get a different treatment in different views on that from some members of, of some business community uh, representatives. Uh, sorry, maybe some other comments. Yeah, I wonder if we can give an opportunity to, to Asha because Asha hasn't um, been able to access the link. So Asha, if you'd like to take the floor and maybe just to share your comment live, I think that would be super helpful. Asha, please. Okay, Hello. I'm not, ah, there we go. Hi, we can yeah, hear you well. Go ahead. 
Yeah, I uh, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm having some technical issues with my internet connection. First of all, greetings. I am Dr. Astha from Princess Noura bin Abdul Rahman University, Saudi Arabia. Uh, I would like to share uh, one thing that uh, uh, with regard to this uh, pollution, water pollution, uh, we have seen that many, uh, there is no proper uh, management related to water pollution, though there are many laws procedures, everything is made, but they are not being properly followed up. So uh, I think so we should work on it. And uh, being into the global world, all countries are uh, linked together, though I am from India, but I'm working in Saudi Arabia. So I should, uh, this is my perception that we should work together uh, to save our environment and especially water because drinkable water is very, very less all over the world. So I hope the panelists, they will be uh, agreeing with that. And thank you so much for giving this opportunity to me. Thank you so much, Asha. And so sorry that the link isn't working for you. I think it's, it's super important that you've raised this point of, you know, sort of sharing the good practices. Um, you know, to replicate some of these um, around decision making in other jurisdictions. Um, colleagues, again, continue to share your comments in the chat box as well. I think we might have time to take maybe one more um, live comment. Is that correct, Sean? Because um, I know you're helping me with it with the time. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. But one more comment, okay. please. No, sorry, 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 I couldn't find my mute button. <laughs> No, no worries. So um, again, let me invite anyone who wants to take the floor to share their comment. Um, I see Jesse has shared something in the chat. Uh, Rafikul has also shared something in the chat. With what, would one of you want to describe your comment live? Please uh, feel free. The floor is open. Hello, Miss Angela. Hi, Jesse. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh... Well, to my opinion, um, I believe there should be complete data because uh, before we can intervene to anything that we would like to intervene, uh, we should have the uh, we should know the feelings and thoughts of the public, and that's why I uh, go with the access to information. That's all. Thank you so much, Jesse. And yes, of course, a super important point there. Um, I guess participants, we, we could be ready to move on to. Uh, let me just. Oh, sorry, Rafikul, did you want to did you want to share something? Yes, uh, I want to share only one thing. That is, uh, individual awareness or self awareness uh, of a industrial sector of people are very important. So there should be there should be a good government uh, good governance policy. Of uh, for every company, how to uh, protect the environment. So, thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Rafikul. Um, we do have a couple more questions to get through, so let me just move us uh, right along to the next question. And again, I will ask Prabina, our technical facilitator, to assist us with this. So, the third question is on the screen now, and this is on legal and regulatory framework. So I'm looking for your views on which of the following is most important, legal regulatory intervention to address the impact of waste management on water pollution and scarcity. So the question is up, the link is again the same. Please go to Menti, make your selection. Angela, it's, it's possible because I, I also added my, uh, my views. Sorry to weight the scales there, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I went through all the questions really fast. Uh, and so I think many people who intend to ask, uh, answer the question may have already done so. Just so we'll give a, a, maybe a, a few more seconds, but I think that's the, that those are the numbers of people who want to say something via the, the Mentimeter function. Mm. This is, ooh, I'm seeing a little bump go up though. Yeah, yeah, I saw that as well. <laughs> Due diligence, this is, this is very interesting. <laughs> I, I also put my answers here already. Yes, Hamantha, do you want to comment on these results already? Yes. I would yeah. love to hear from you. I, I, I have tried many of these uh, approaches in Sri Lanka, 
um, and I realized that if you have the stronger legal frameworks and and the and the true enforcement, I think that's that's the only way because we all try to. I mean, we as the humans, we we try to violate the laws, you know. So it's it's breaking the law is is in our blood. So unless you have a for the common common purpose, unless you have you bring them standards, laws, and regulations, etc., and enforce properly, it's very hard to keep because. If you just say, okay, just think about uh, the nature, think about your children, people will not do that. I'm surprised. Thank you, Hemant. Andrew, if I may, I'm surprised at how low environmental impact assessment is for this this small group here. Um, it did so, it actually did so differently. I was about to say it did so well. <laughs> Again, this, this is a sporting event. But in fact, environmental impact assessments rated very high uh, in our survey, our online mm. survey. So it's yeah, interesting yeah. to see it, it low here. And maybe that's under the influence of uh, Hemant's uh, earlier comments that he's done uh, uh, these before. <laughs> no, not, not, not really. I, I think I would think if you talk to the multilateral development banks, so they are very much interested about the environmental mm. impact. That's the only tool they can they can use under the safeguards say, in, in the national uh -huh. countries. But on the on the practical situation on the ground, so the environmental impact assessment, including the multilateral development bank impact assessment, are not useful yeah. because the environmental management plans are not not properly implementing, and there are ways and means that they can get the approval, even if the public oppose, you know, they get the approval with some conditions, and the conditions don't. Uh, don't uh, uh, apply on the ground. So that's why people are now fed up. Uh, I mean, we, are, we, are we are continuing to training on the EIS, but uh, so that's the practical situation. Mm. What is it that you, I'm sorry, Angela, can I ask uh, Hemant a question real quick or is there someone else? I don't mean to monopolize the time. No, no, please other? go ahead. I don't see any uh, other hands for now. What, what is it you would have us, I've been working in rule of law for a long time, and it's it's a struggle uh, to get, to strengthen legal frameworks and enforcement, whether that be uh, criminal justice or that be environmental justice. And, and I do want to highlight that UNEP has an environmental rule of law framework that's promoting, um, yeah. been doing so since about 2019. Um, what, what, where would you focus our, our efforts? What, what would you have us do more of? The government, governments, yeah, and multilateral actually, agencies. No, we 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 are doing multiple uh, multiple tasks here because we we are our, we are set up for environmental justice uh, work uh, because a lot, lot of people who are affected from various environmental issues come to us and we have a free legal aid clinic. Um, so we are we we provide all the free legal uh, support and we we fight on the on the national issues, and and on on top of that, so I think monitoring the multilateral development banks is really useful if you want to to mm. reduce the impacts to the ground. Um, so we use the accountability mechanisms in the World Bank, ADB, AIIB. Uh, so they are really useful, uh, super useful actually because. Uh, um, because if, if the policies are correct, so then then you can really convince the uh, the multilateral development banks. Unfortunately, that's not the situation at the local level. Even if the law is good in, in the local level, um, you might not be able to convince because of the corruption, the political pressure, and various other factors behind. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Hemantha, and for uh, Sean. Um, I think we have less than 10 minutes left. So I would really like to hear feedback from participants on, on, on one question that is sort of uh, cross-cutting across you know, all of the different breakout rooms and, and on this particular topic. And, and this question is around the gender dimensions of the interventions that have been suggested uh, to address water pollution, water scarcity. Um, we don't have a, a fancy menti link for this one, um, so I'd like to take your comments again via the chat box um, or live. Uh, again, feel free to just raise your hand or just to speak up. So again, um, everyone, just uh, your feedback, your, your thoughts on the, the gender dimensions of the interventions that have been suggested to address uh, water pollution and water scarcity. Do I see any hands? Let me, let me review the interventions from the prior slide. They were access to information, access yep. to justice, inclusive decision-making, uh, protection of human rights defenders. Hmm. 
Everyone's yeah, been the, <laughs> very quiet. <yeah. laughs> One of the, the reasons why we thought the, the question was important, uh, beyond the obvious that uh, we need to hear from women, uh, is that, is that uh, sometimes inclusive decision-making is actually exclusive of women. So does that mean that we shouldn't invest as much in that? Uh, some people say that access to justice, uh, the barriers to women's access to justice are too, too burdensome, uh, given extra care work that they carry uh, also, um, the pressure is not to take things to court, but to mediate. Uh, it does not mean uh, that actually, if we invest uh, everything there, that we're going to um, not reach women, not, not solve our problems. Uh, so I, I think that Maggie had some reflections as I was speaking. Maggie, did, did you want to say something? Thanks, Sean. I was actually trying to type out everything, but yes, exactly what you mentioned. Um, I think we have the exact same points. Domestic responsibility, social stigma, and inaccessibility to some of these uh, in-person meetings. And sometimes there's just a, it's just not okay for women to uh, to speak up and to represent themselves, their hardships, um, the demand for a fair wage uh, or living wage. These are some of the components that we're seeing in um, Southeast Asia, especially, but uh, definitely uh, an, a phenomenon that's not um, exclusive to Southeast Asia. Um, and we're, when we're putting together uh, plastic standards that include plastic credits, meaning that the recovery of plastics are being remunerated in a fair way by corporations. Um, women who are actually partaking in these events would be paid less than men as they're being subcontracted. So this is something that we're trying to prevent by introducing the concepts of human rights and having um, permanent um, advisory council counselors who are sitting in our committees advising towards this matter. But um, yeah, there's really no silver bullet. Uh, we are trying to actually be as inclusive as possible, but the penetration of what we can do um, from our desk jobs is very limited if we don't involve anyone who's on ground and representing these groups, inclusive of women. Anybody want to react to that? Sorry, Angela, I should have asked you to ask that. <laughs> no, 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 um, please, Sean. <laughs> yeah. Um, and actually, I know I'm, I'm, um, I'm, that's that's a very important question because in this sort of a patriarchal societies, you know, the picking water and even even when it comes to the health of their children, etc., even the water pollution is a, is a very important thing uh, for for women to um, uh, have address. So that's why I think that's that's quite important. But I, I I know in Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, you know, I have visited some some of those places where some sometimes people women have to walk about eleven kilometers to bring water drink in drinking water while the water is available in their rivers and the lakes uh, which is polluted you can't drink you know so um, I, I think this water pollution is a is a is a is, is very much close to the to the women in the house so I think so that's what uh, why important mm -hmm. And I think it's also important when we look at the issue of environmental human rights defenders and women environmental human rights defenders. And this is something that we've been working on. I think that interventions uh, when it comes to women environmental defenders need to be sort of different because those um, the harms and, and the risks that they're, they're facing are also quite, quite different. I saw different, uh, yeah. a message. Yeah, I saw a message from Samad and uh, Samad, I wonder if you wanted to make your comment live. Um, you know, your reflections on what Surya was saying in the opening, on, in the opening session. Sure. Um, thanks, Angela. Yeah, so I was just uh, referring back to Dr. Deva's comments about when we talk about impact of, uh, when we talk about environmental impact, so we differentiate it at several levels, at the country level, community level, and even at the at the individual level. And while we were having this uh, discussion, I was quickly looking at the at the UNGP's uh, gender guidance, the gender booklet, and that has a specific point about the differentiated impacts of environmental pollution, climate change, land acquisition, and how they aren't gender neutral. And uh, Mr. Himantha and Maggie just spoke about this as well. Um, so the example given in the gender booklet is about how, for example, infrastructure activities in rural areas can have different impacts on women who may have to walk longer distances, just like Mr. Hemantha said, and um, for uh, other activities as well, they might not receive a fair share of compensation if their livelihood is affected. 
by a specific uh, infrastructure project. So, th so this point exists and uh, uh, I'm uh, really looking forward to future guidance about how this can be expanded and how both uh, from a human rights and environmental perspective, you look at the overlaps and uh, you know what sort of tools and guidance comes out of this. Uh, but yeah, Mr. Himantha's experience also with uh, with the low compliance of environmental impact assessments, I think that also needs to really inform how due diligence is also taken forward and what sort of mm -hmm. tools and compliance is expected from businesses uh, given the ongoing challenges uh, in this. Uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Samad. Um, colleagues, I think we are almost completely out of time now. Um, and so what's going to happen now is that we will head back to the to the plenary, to the main room, and I hope to be able to accurately report back on the key findings from our discussion in this group. So thank you so much for your super active participation, and we'll see you back in the big room. See you there. Thanks, Angela. Thank you. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Sean. Thank you, everyone. I think you'll be moved automatically, or I'm not. I'm not sure exactly how it works. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, uh, we're forced back in. Uh, usually, the it's rather abrupt. Um, <laughs> but maybe they'll shoot us. Yeah, any moment now. I'll keep. Okay, Dory says she's closing it now. See you okay. Soon, guys. Thanks again, everyone. See you later. Hi, welcome back, everybody. I think we're all in the main room. Um, I, in the interest of time, I'm just going to assume we are. Uh, we're about five minutes away from uh, closing out our session. Um, let us go straight. Let me let me just go straight to uh, the the to our to our facilitators uh, to discuss the findings from their room, uh, leaving it to about a, a minute. Uh, about have about a minute each uh, to speak about those findings. Uh, Georgina, let's start with you. Thanks, Sean. Um, I, I feel like we really just uh, was the top of the iceberg of, of getting into some of the findings around these questions. But in terms of the, the first question, uh, the majority of the respondents said that it did, yes, somewhat uh, align with their expectations. And 14 responded that, yes, it did align with their expectations. Um, some of this was because there is a need to, to further disaggregate the data or some of the mm. comments and to delve into who was saying what, and, and not just in terms of geographic determination, but, but what um, stakeholder group did they represent? Uh, and uh, who, who, were the, who were the responses coming from? And, and to really understand that uh, to a greater degree. Mm -hmm. For the second question, um, the number one uh, choice was uh, inclusive decision making. And, that some of the responses around that was that inclusive decision making can enable uh, access to justice and it can enable access to information if you have fair and equitable and inclusive um, decision making processes. Um, there were some other comments though that um, in order to have access to justice, you all also need to have an enabling environment in which those who are seeking justice are protected. Um, and so that uh, also covered the, the point around the need to protect environmental defenders. And similarly, that um, inclusive uh, decision-making processes means that all of those, including those that speak for the environment, are given the opportunity to, to voice their opinions. Um, moving on to the third, and, and there were many other very valuable comments, but I'm just being very brief. Um, moving on to, to the third point, um, uh, there was there was some comments actually that came out under the second um, of the need to um, talk about gender and, and how uh, we need to consider the gender dimension. So that was really important. But there is a need for stronger legal frameworks and enforcement. That was the highest response. Um, and there were comments around the fact that often there are good laws in place, but there is a failure to enforce and implement and, and a lack of government will to ensure that that enforcement takes place um, in order to provide the adequate resources for it. Um, and oh, there was an important overriding comment that by having these choices, we're setting up a false expectation that they're competing that these are competing mm -hmm. places and that these things are not competing.
that we need to be able to put in place all of these factors in order to, to achieve um, a sustainable uh, development to in order to ensure that um, human rights are respected in regards to the environment. Uh, finally, for, for the gender response, uh, there was a comment that there needs to be continued capacity building and rights awareness, and that in order to have equal representation, there must be respect amongst the voices. Uh, and until we create more respect, then we cannot have equal voices and equal representation. So there needs to be um, respect from the leadership all the way down at all levels. So I'll leave it there, Sean. Thanks. Impressive, impressive uh, group and impressive uh, report back. Um, indeed, we're, you know, I'm sure we'll hear some similar themes coming out of our climate uh, group and some uh, other priorities. And forgive me for always pitching one intervention against another. I admit it seemed like a race in some cases today. Uh, we won't make that mistakes in the fact. In fact, going uh, forward, and I do want to point to a, a, a really important paper. I think it came out in 2012. Uh, Asia's wicked environmental problems. And it does describe you know, these problems are so complex, actually do need an all in approach and you need a, an all stakeholder in approach, a multi stakeholder approach as well. So that comment is, is very well taken. Um, Livio, can you report back on uh, your findings from uh, your breakout room? Sure, with, with pleasure, uh, Sean. I, it took a little bit of time to warm up, but then, and as, as often happens, we actually have uh, too many, too many comments and not enough time uh, to uh, to, dis to 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 bring them all in. But let me start. And some you will see are, are repeated uh, uh, from what Georgina already presented. I'll try to highlight some newer elements uh, on the question on how, how uh, the participants felt about whether the the, the survey reflected or not their views. Uh, not surprisingly, and, and uh, as it happened with the previous group, most of the people went into the uh, selected in somewhat, yes. I don't think there was actually anybody that chose the, the no function. So in principle, it, it, was, it, it was felt that we reflected to a large extent uh, the views of, of all the participants, at least to my breakout room. In terms of comments, we, we got some interesting comments on, on, on this um, question. One point that was stressed again, again by, by Commissioner Cariz, who helped us in breaking the ice, was uh, the, the, the importance of not uh, necessarily criminalizing the, the energy industry uh, uh, if uh, uh, opportunities are not given to transition to renewable energy, because the shutting down or the, or the sudden reducing of the energy industry could actually lead to human rights violations. So interesting perspective on how somehow human rights violations are also linked somehow to choices uh, of, of the environmental sector that are not necessarily the most obvious one. And interestingly, a comment came later, uh, uh, and, and again, let me finish by saying that the point uh, uh, Commissioner Cadiz made is that the crime is not necessarily uh, from the, in the, the, the energy industry, but to those that are blocking the transition to re uh, renewable energy. Mm -hmm. But again, an interesting point was made later by another participant pointing to the fact that sometimes actually also the, the, the renewable energy industries are pointed to as uh, being the cause of human rights violation. So a scenario which is quite complicated uh, as a matter of fact, so it, it, could, it could have sprung a whole discussion on an entire session. On the second question of the procedural rights uh, uh, intervention that should be uh, uh, prioritized, the point was made strongly as uh, with the previous group of, of all these options not competing with each other. One of our participants said that uh, she selected other simply because could not unselect all the others. Because again, all those procedural aspects need to be put in place. There was a feeling that many shared and and there was one that uh, did uh, uh, um, was uh, in, uh, by, all, by all means uh, uh, voted the most in inclusive decision making but again most felt that all of them are necessary 
comment made on the fact that human rights, part of human rights defenders was not there. It's a point that you raised, Sean, and was raised again in our session. So certainly a point made on, on greater focus to, to be placed on human rights defenders and their protection. Lastly, I'll close comments on this point by, by um, quoting some of the grievance mechanisms that are aware there, because the point was made that uh, grievance mechanisms are crucial in, this, in these cases. Uh, and uh, the, the, the point was made on the Green, Green Climate Fund redress mechanism being there for human rights defenders uh, to make their complaints, as well as, of course, the NCP and the NHR rights. Going to the last question, as far as we are concerned, because we couldn't unfortunately make it to discuss the four question on gender, Sean, I will say that when it comes to the um, legal regulation, regular intervention, they should be prioritized. Uh, stronger legal frameworks, again, perhaps not surprisingly, came uh, by far on top. Um, but points were made about uh, enforcement. Again, a point raised uh, by, by Georgina that is worth uh, emphasizing because uh, all our participants felt very strong about it. Um, there can be, if legal in framework are in place, but they are not enforced is, is as they were not in place at all. A similar point was made on the importance, uh, no doubt about human rights impact assessment and human rights due diligence, but HRIA and HRDDs uh, uh, within a framework of no accountability have little value, uh, some, some mm. said. Uh, mm. Lastly, local enforcement, enforcement at the local level was pointed to as uh, absolutely uh, critical. I'll stop here, Sean. Thank you, Livio, very much. And let me ask, um, you know, I make some comments, but I'd be, I'd be, I'd be eating into our time. But I would like uh, Dory to go ahead and put the, in the chat box uh, the, the questionnaire with regards to uh, uh, people's feelings about this uh, uh, feedback on, on, the, on the event itself, if you don't mind. Uh, thank you very much, Dory. Uh, and then hand over to, to Angela. Angela? Yeah, thank you so much, Sean. So in our group, we had about 40 participants, diverse backgrounds. Um, only one question where the, our group's results were slightly different from the, the main survey results. Um, on question one, not too much to add to what the other two groups have um, spoken about already. Um, I think mo mainly uh, participants agreed that it, it aligned with their expectations. Um, there was also um, on the second and the third questions, there was also a lot of additional feedback that was shared by our uh, group. Um, so on the second question, again, like group one, the group felt that um, inclusive decision making was key. So there were some suggestions to have sharing of good practices around inclusive decision-making processes and the need to have individual groups represented in decision-making processes. So participants also spoke about the flaws in these processes or on, around uh, making decisions, uh, the question of data and accurate information in a manner that is accessible for the different groups was raised as well. So basically we need complete and better data and access to information to enable people to make decisions. Um, on question three, this was slightly different from the, the main survey, the, the results in our group. So the participants felt that stronger legal frameworks and enforcement was um, the, the main issue here, the most important one. Um, I think that EIA is part of these legal, legal frameworks. So, so maybe it makes sense that then, you know, EIA was ranked uh, lowest in our little group discussion. Um, there was also a lot of uh, discussion on challenges around implementation of legal frameworks, just as um, my two colleagues have mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, and compliance with these instruments. Um, the issue of corruption and low capacity in monitoring and enforcement of legal frameworks was also discussed uh, in the context of, of uh, water laws or environmental laws that have uh, water provisions um, on water scarcity and waste management as well. Um, an example was given of how laws and procedures are not being properly followed and the need for cooperation on the implementation of these laws and policies that are focused on addressing water pollution and waste management. Uh, we managed to get to the question of gender, which was great. Again, very good and interesting discussion um, in our group. Participants raised the example of informal waste pickers. Um, with one of our participants um, sharing on, on the plastic pollution situation and the role of women informal waste pickers. 
There was also some reflection on the differentiation issue that was raised by uh, Dr. Deva in his opening uh, comments. So basically that we need differentiated approaches to address the differentiated impacts of water mm -hmm. issues on, on women and on men. I think at the heart of it, many societies continue to remain patriarchal and it's important for this to be addressed um, and for women to have a voice. And then this also links with the unique and differentiated challenges faced by women environmental defenders. I know we're out of time, so I'll leave it there, Sean. Thanks very much. And thanks again to our small group. That was an, uh, really incredible. I haven't been there, the note taker. I, I, for that event, I would never have been able to squeeze as much uh, information out of the uh, that discussion as Angela did. Very impressive. Uh, thanks everybody for your participation in the breakout room and in uh, the roundtable discussion. Uh, I'm going to turn it right over to Livio for a closing remark. Uh, but before I do so, just to say this, we're not trying to figure out which intervention is better than the other. It's not really competition, but we do have in mind a, a large, uh, a large-ish uh, study uh, on on the links between business human rights and the environment. And so we wanted to know what we should prioritize uh, in that study. It is of course no study can cover everything uh, well. We will cover some things as well as possible. So. If we're really just trying to prioritize for purposes of the study and for advocacy in the immediate sense. I, I don't want get pe uh, people to have an impression uh, otherwise. Uh, it was really for practical purposes. So thanks again for that. Uh, without further ado, allow me to hand over Livio for some uh, closing remarks. Thank you, thank you, Sean. Uh, closing remarks is 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 uh, is, a, is a big word. I, I I'll just <laughs> the final reflections. Uh, what I actually liked of this of this. Uh, uh, dialogue today was the the climate of informality and certainly I don't, I don't want to formalize it by doing any uh, formal final statement uh, I'll certainly use 30 seconds to do first things first and 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 uh, if I congratulate you and the rest of the team for for an incredible job but you really deserve an applause for that and 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 I give a big thanks to, to UNEP for being a great partner uh, for this event uh, to of course express my gratitude to to all the speakers uh, um, somehow also uh, express the regret that we didn't give them enough time uh, mm. to talk more because I, I felt that there was so much that they have said in only only three minutes and they, and, and they could have said a lot more but um uh, I, I, you know that this is not uh, certainly the last time that we will be speaking about this subject. In fact, I think I, I honestly never felt more than, than, than in this webinar, uh, really uh, a, a, an interest in taking this discussion forward, in, in, in expanding the conversation. I feel perhaps uh, 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 at times we, we, we could have really given more space to, to, each, uh, to each of them. I'm delighted, of course, to see so much, um, such a broad participation from all the sectors and, and uh, vivid discussion. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, the point that I, I believe was made over and over and over uh, in, in, in all the discussion was the issue of, of knowledge uh, about um, uh, uh, clarifying the linkages between uh, business and human rights and the environment. Hopefully today we took that discourse a little step ahead and started to discuss and clarify some of the issues. Even highlighted some of the misunderstandings are there. It's clear that this takes a lot more uh, discussions and, and a lot more reflections. We do have now a, a community of practice of business and human rights and environment practitioners, those that uh, have joined the conversation today, I hope will want to join us for the rest uh, of the discussions that we will have on business and human rights and environment uh, in the uh, three more years to come as far as this project is concerned. And of course, it's a discussion that will be keep going even beyond the life of this very project. So I, I do hope um, those that have been with us today will remain engaged with this court, with this discourse in, in future events and future activities in which we'll, we'll need their inputs and, and their reflections to guide us and to try to make the difference in this uh, uh, important subject. I'll stop here and I thank you all very much. Thank you, Livio. And indeed, uh, from, from everyone here in Bangkok on the Business and Human Rights team, I do know we've been taking very good notes. Uh, we'll combine these uh, with our uh, survey results for, for a wrap up report and then embark on a much larger study. We hope we can turn to you as resources and you'll be available in the future for future conversations. So from Bangkok, thank you very much. Kapu makra and have a great day.